Tiene traducciones para la persona que lo necesiten. Si alguien lo necesita, por favor, le dejan saber a la mesa de atrás en la esquina y le proveen lo, la herramienta para que tengamos la traducción. Eh, pero además de la traducción, quiero decirle de que hoy nosotros estamos aquí con un objetivo que es salvar la industria libre, salvar la industria de los corporate black car. Y va junto con mi responsabilidad de también salvar la industria amarilla. Nueva York es un lugar de oportunidades para todos. Y el éxito de un grupo no puede ser con el precio del fracaso de otro. Por eso nosotros, de la misma forma que creemos que es correcto proveer asistencia a los choferes amarillos, a los que son dueños de los medallones, también nosotros tenemos que tomar las iniciativas necesarias para ayudar a los hombres y mujeres libres. Yo fui libre. I was 112 a Caddy Car Service. And then it grew from Caddy and Seaman, we create Bailey Car Service. So I'm not here without the experience or know what it is, what it was to be a liberal taxi driver. And I also had been working to level the playing field. And as everyone knows that, I always say that the city of New York provides opportunity to everyone. To those who have a high volume ad, there's a market for you guys. For those that had a family corporate black car for decades, there should be opportunity for them. For the 15,000 medallions, including the 6,000 individual medallion owners, or those small corporations of individual and corporations that they own 20, 25 medallions, there should be opportunity for them. So as we are getting close to finalize our medallion task force, which was a bill that I introduced, that we passed like three years ago, and a task force that have a deadline of the 31st of this month to submit the report to the mayor and to the speaker, and from there it will be a public document. A document that will have a lot of recommendation, beyond recommendation of how uh, the city should explore, work with the public private sector and dealing with the challenges to explore about financial assistance, what mechanism can do the work. A lot of recommendations are also related to calling to expand TLC as an agency so that the agency can respond to the need and to the TLC as an industry of the, tw of the 2020. A lot of recommendation about enforcement, a lot of recommendation about innovation on technology. So as we are getting close to release a report by the 31st, it is also our responsibility to address the other sector that no everyone is talking about, the liberal taxi driver, the, those affiliated with the corporate black car. So that's why we're here today. Again, so don't take me wrong as we are addressing ideas, suggestions, recommendation to be helpful to the library is not because we have forgetting, forgiven the, the other sector that we've been working with, but this is about, as we are getting close to recommendation medallions. We also have dozen of bases, they've been closing. We have many drivers that they were offered that they would be making $3,000 a week. And they took the $4,000 they was offered as a promotion they found out that they, can, they are not making $1,000 a week, not even $3,000. So again, that's the purpose of today. You know, we want to welcome everyone here. As everyone know, I'm Idanis Rodriguez, the chair of this committee today. Uh, we also been joined by Councilmember Cabrera and Cohen. It, and, and today we will be conducting a hearing on three bills. Uh, that I have a sponsor related to Fort Ohio Bill Co-Industry, 
But I gotta say that Councilman Carrera also has been a champion also advocating for, for, for deliberate drivers. That's also my colleague here, Councilman Cohen, he also been working addressing the challenges that we face in the taxi industry in our city. This council, in collaboration with the administration and TLC, has taken a numbers of, of, of over, on, uh, taken numerous measures over the past several years to help raise the standard of living of Ohio drivers. Despite our efforts to help increase their income, many liberal and black car drivers are still struggling to make ends meet. We need to explore creative ways to help increase the monthly income that drivers earn. We cannot stop with the minimum driver's pay rules. This is an industry where many drivers are working 10, 12 hours a day, seven days a week. I live that experience. I know that drivers, we gotta work, especially from Friday to Sunday. That's why we have more riders, especially those that provide the services in the library. Lo que trabaja en los libros sabemos que de viernes a domingo es que uno trabaja más porque donde alma pasajero. That's a weekend that you like to be in your family, with your family, with your children, you with your wife or your husband. But in order to make your living, you need to work from Friday evening, almost without a stop, up to Sunday. And still, you are struggling and you need your help and we are committed to provide you hope. Just like we were able to increase the awareness for the, for the taxi medallion owners, we need to also look into the issues impacting the liberal and black car drivers who are composed of many immigrant drivers as well. Those of you who provide the services, especially in Washington Heights, in the South Bronx, in Brooklyn, in Queens, in Staten Island, in community where you know your passenger, and sometimes those passengers, they don't, sometimes they don't even have the money, and you take it to the destination, and they pay you days after, because you are a family community-oriented business. There's no New York City without yellow taxi. There's no New York City without liberal basis, and many of them being closing. Today we will be looking into a few bills which aim to help struggling taxi drivers. The first bill, intro number 1738, will prohibit TLC from banning stereo advertising on the four higher vehicles, including the ban on rooftop advertising. I've been doing, and I will continue doing the best to help with the yellow, especially zero tolerance for anyone that do pick up down 96th Street at the JFK in LaGuardia. But I, as I will be leading this effort together with the speaker, my colleague, and the advocate, private owners, medallions, drivers, to get in happen. Yesterday I had a meeting with the Port Authority saying the yellow should be protected at the JFK in LaGuardia. So as I'm doing that, I'm also asking to share the opportunity for drivers who are related, associated with the liberal and the corporate black car to be able to also put the advertise in the top of the vehicles and inside so that they can make additional thousand dollars a year. There's no competition if we are able to structure it well. My second piece of legislation a pre-considered bill that will be introduced at tomorrow's state meeting will allow for Ohio vehicles drivers to advertise on the interior of their vehicles by displaying digital advertising on a tablet. It has been estimated that the revenue generated from this type of advertising can be about two or three hundred dollars a month, extra income that for Ohio vehicle drivers can use to pay for their over ever increasing monthly expenses and will not require any increase in hours spent on the road. The final bill on today's agenda is a pre-considered intro that will establish a black car and liberal task force. Just two months ago, this committee held an oversight hearing titled The Current Situation for Liberty and Corporate Black Cars during the hearing. We heard testimony about how this sector is hurting. 
the task force created under this bill will be charged with studying the numerous challenges this particular sector is currently experiencing and then issuing a report with their finding and recommendation. The task force will be similar in scope to the task force that the council created that is currently studying and the plight of drivers in the yellow medallion industry. And I want that task force as, is, you know, as it is a structure in the proposal to be composed by 11 members, including the chair of the designated from the TLC, the speaker, the mayor, but that task force I want to be led by drivers. Nosotros queremos que el task force que se va a dedicar a estudiar lo que tiene que ver con la crisis de los taxis amarillos sea motivado, guiado por la experiencia de los choferes para que de esa forma se puedan poner las recomendaciones. I look forward to hearing everyone's testimony and working with the administration, TLC and the stakeholders to enact these bills. Before I ask the committee council to administer the oath, I would like also to recognize, recognize Council Member Levine and Richards who also are here with us today. I now ask the committee council to please administer the affirmation and then invite you to deliver your statement. And thank you for the great job that you have done as the intern TLC committee. You've been accessible, you've been fair, and you've been having an open ear to listen to the need and explore and explore ideas on how we can take TLC to the new level. So I know that hopefully with the new chair coming on board, you will stay because your contribution is very important for our city and for the taxi industry. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez, members of the Transportation Committee. I'm Bill Heinzen, the Acting Commissioner of the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. Thank you for inviting me here this morning for this hearing on legislation that would create a livery and traditional black car task force, as well as legislation to allow advertising in and on for hire vehicles in New York City. Um, Pre-considered intro number 5549 would create a livery and traditional black car task force to identify any challenges to the viability of the industry and to make recommendations to address the task force's findings. As I have testified before, uh, TLC and the mayor support the creation of this task force. Uh, I can, uh, in the interest of time, I can shorten some of my testimony on the task force but I just want to repeat, as I said, that we support the creation of this. I think there's a variety of issues um, that are foremost in your minds, in TLC's minds, and obviously in the drivers and the livery community's minds, um, including um, tr you know, availability of drivers, availability of vehicles, issues like insurance, et cetera, that I think the task force can look at. Those are just some of the issues. Um, Intro number 1738 and pre-considered intro number 5628 would allow interior and exterior advertising in for hire vehicles. TLC's long-standing rules prohibiting advertising on and inside for hire vehicles were challenged in federal court and TLC could not enforce the rule for approximately one year while the courts considered the case. During that time, TLC received few applications for advertising permits and only 82 for exterior advertising were issued. Last summer, a federal appellate court upheld the rule in a decision that reinforced the city's authority to regulate commercial advertising in public spaces, as well as the city's interest in regulating the interior of the vehicles that TLC licenses. Allowing over 100,000 licensed for hire vehicles in every neighborhood and in every borough to carry advertising may greatly expand advertising in the public, and this legislation may impact the city's regulation of advertising far beyond TLC issues. With the city's limited authority to regulate ad content unless it is obscene or criminal, ads could be for anything from Broadway musicals to strip clubs, both inside and outside of vehicles. Once these ads are permitted, it will be difficult to scale them back. As currently drafted, pre-considered intro number 5628 appears to prohibit the city's ability to require permits or licenses for displaying interior ads, which will make it difficult to know how the full extent, to know the full extent of such problems. 
because the city will not even know how many vehicles have interior advertising, let alone which ones. I have testified before that expanding advertising to for hire vehicles raises challenges that we need to address and that I think we can address. The new task force may provide a good forum for some of these discussions. TLC understands the desire to increase driver revenue, which has been one of our key policy missions in this administration. But we always ask if the financial benefits of any new technology will actually reach drivers in a meaningful way. And that's a concern I know the council shares. To ensure that potential benefits are not overstated and that drivers would actually benefit from for hire vehicle advertising rather than just the advertising companies themselves, leasing companies or the apps, it is important that the city retain the necessary authority to address these concerns. Any promised financial benefits should be clear to the drivers and or vehicle owners. They should be consistent, they should be guaranteed, and they should be readily enforceable. It is also important to remember that it may not just be one or two companies that want to sell advertising. In addition to the companies that have already come forward, there will likely be several business models for advertising and a wide variety in the terms offered to drivers. These advertising terms and conditions may leave drivers with little say or lock them into one-sided legal agreements. Mandatory arbitration clauses, which waive the right to bring class actions in the courts, non-disparagement agreements, terminations without cause, and the lack of any guarantee of any specific payment or any guaranteed time frame for payments are issues that concern all of us and we must be able to protect drivers and owners against them. Because advertising relies on increased visibility, it will likely be easier and more desirable for corporations to enter into agreements with leasing companies that own many vehicles or with app companies or bases than to make individual agreements with individual drivers or vehicle owners. In taxis, for example, most advertising is done on a fleet model and the drivers do not share the revenues. If adver companies, advertising companies do enter into fleet-based companies, agreements, excuse me, drivers who lease vehicles may well see little or no benefit. Allowing interior advertising may raise other specific concerns for drivers and passengers. We often hear passenger complaints about interior advertising in yellow taxis. But we also hear complaints from yellow taxi drivers and the drivers tell us that the ads can be annoying um, with the same audio playing on repeat all shift long. Even with prohibitions against obscene content, there will be no meaningful way to restrict advertising that some passengers might find offensive. Extending interior ads to for hire vehicles would multiply these passenger and driver concerns by tens of thousands. It's also not fully clear what impact FHV advertising may have on taxi advertising revenue. With a large increase in ads for for hire vehicles, such competition may drive down the revenue potential for taxis and street hail liveries, causing unintended financial consequences. So it is important that we discuss these issues and that we leave the city the authority to address them so that drivers and vehicle owners are not excluded from advertising profits. On a personal, personal note, um, Chair Rodriguez and members of the committee, I ap appreciate very much your comments. At the beginning, uh, I think the collaboration that the TLC has been able to have with the City Council through the Transportation Committee has been important. And as I've said many times, I always think that when we work together, we get the most done. Um, we've had disagreements over the years and that's to be expected, but I uh, appreciate that um, we have been able to have those discussions both at hearings and outside of hearings. And um, I'm I'm grateful for the time that committee members and other members of city council have given to me and my staff for meetings and inviting us into your districts where we have done events. I th um, so I want to thank you for that collaboration uh, and thank you for inviting me to address these challenges. And instead of starting myself asking the question, I'm going to be calling my cut, right? Council member Cabrera. Oh, wow. I'm shocked. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> for this opportunity. Uh, as an acting commissioner, I, I just have a, a couple of questions uh, regarding um, Council member Rodriguez's uh, bill. Uh, the first one, if I understand right, your biggest concern regarding outdoor uh, the ones that go on the roof, mm -hmm. uh, advertisement. Uh, 
is basically that you're concerned that the driver will not directly benefit from it. Is that, is, am I hearing you right in your testimony? That, that's correct. Uh, generally, whenever companies come with a solution that's going to promise money, we're always nervous because we've seen this in the past where they've come and the drivers haven't benefited or vehicle owners haven't benefited. But what about if the, the bill was drafted that will make the provision and will structure in such a way that the drivers will get the benefit? Would that be something that the TLC be open to? Yeah, abs absolutely. I, th I think that many of our concerns can be addressed either through um, changes to the legislation or allowing TLC the latitude to ensure those changes in any regulation that we would pass. Commissioner, I really appreciate that response. I think that would be like the quickest point A to point B solution. Mr. Chair, I, I, I really uh, would encourage you uh, to make those amendments so our drivers are able uh, to benefit uh, from uh, this advertisement. The indoor uh, advertisement, is, is there any way possible that uh, the passenger will have a choice to have an on or off I button? Think the I think the legislation itself requires that that option be there to, to mute the advertising. And with that, so that oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 I interrupted. So you were saying? Um, and I think and I will say, I think we know from our experience in taxi, sometimes those buttons don't work, aren't as responsive as we want them to be, <clears throat> but that requirement is in the legislation, which is a good thing. Um, and that can help the passengers. You still have the drivers who are, <clears throat> excuse me, in the car and they don't have that option to turn it off or not when the passenger's in there. So the drivers are subjected to the repeated messages or advertising if uh, you know if we think back to different programs that that uh, have occurred in yellow taxis with celebrity voices for example i think on the third or seventh or 27th time it can get a little old hearing it it's like working a in a store you keep hearing the same song over and over again right like a mariah carey christmas song <laughs> That was a good one. Uh, but is, is there any way maybe to require uh, that the driver will have uh, the ability to turn it on and off and basically ask the pas passenger, would you like to have the advertisement on uh, every time they come in? Would that be something that you would be amicable to? Uh, that may, uh, I hadn't thought about that. that. That may be an approach, I don't know if the companies themselves are going to like that, but that may be an approach. I mean, I would imagine if it's in the bill mm -hmm. uh, and it passes, mm -hmm. that would be for the companies to consider mm -hmm. uh, whether they want it or not. And mm -hmm. I would imagine they would, you know, there's thousands and hundreds of thousands of passengers every day. And it gives the power to the driver and also to the customer uh, who uh, is, is, is driving. Those were my only questions. Uh, turn it back to the chair, Mr. Chair. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to be able to ask right from the beginning. Thank you again. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you, Councilmember Coyne. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I don't know if I have a question, and I. I really, I'm relatively new to this committee and my expertise in this area is incredibly limited, but mm -hmm. I will tell you as, an, you know, as a New Yorker, as someone here at the council, and, and I, I'm, I'm not trying to blame you or like, uh, but I, I just really want to go on record. Uh, my frustration about the condition of this industry at large, that you know, I've been in office for six years, the mayor's been in office for six years, and this industry was in terrible shape when we got here, and it, uh, you know, and despite, you know, my my chair here has some you know good ideas about ways to help individual drivers, but the, this industry is really just in such bad shape that the plight of the drivers is so bad, you know whether it's yellows and, and the medallion crisis, like from stem to stern, this industry is in such poor shape, and I really don't feel like that we have, you know, at, at this late stage in, in 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 our tenures that there's a comprehensive solution on the horizon that is going to make a viable industry so that New Yorkers can go from point A to point B by car 
at a, at a, a price they can afford that provides drivers with a, a, a living wage, that we have a functional taxi and limousine or, you know, there's so many, I don't even know what the right word is for all the different fragmentation in the, in the car industry. Um, and again, I'm not, uh, you know, you, you're the interim chair. I'm glad that you're doing it. I know, uh, I, I understand that there, there is a, a proposed chair coming down the pike. And, but I really just, uh, you know, I just hope that you could take the word back that really, you know, the clock is ticking, uh, you know, and, and literally it's not exa an exaggeration that it's life and death for some people that it, I would feel good if I left t my term in office feeling that we had really made some comprehensive change to get this industry to a place where, like, again, where people could make a living and it could still serve New Yorkers. So I, I don't have a question, Chair, but I really appreciate the time. And I appreciate ha your hard work over these many years and your continued effort to try to get us on a course. Thank you. Thank you. Could I respond? Please. So um, <laughs> thank you for that question. I would just say that you have done a lot as a member of the City Council. It took many years <clears throat> for the apps they came in. They did a lot of, they liked, uh, they disrupted the industry to use their term. The disruption was pretty severe and it was pretty severe in yellow. It was severe in green. It was severe in livery, traditional black car. I mean, it has transformed the industry. It's 85,000 more vehicles, 85,000 more drivers. There is no question. And there is no question that this industry, parts of this industry are in crisis and there's different types of crisis. And part of that problem is that we are operating in a regulatory framework that is not fully under our control because a lot of it is set by state law. That is, I know that is a frustrating for you. That is a constant source of frustration for us. But given the tools that we have, we actually have done a lot and that we is city council and the mayor and TLC. And one of the biggest steps that was taken, again, it took a long time to get into this. You can't just turn things around overnight. One of the biggest steps that was taken was the vehicle license cap, also the driver pay policy. There have been a lot of um, efforts have been taken to try to inject more liquidity into the medallion market and to unfreeze the market. We're dealing with major problems here, but in fact, s pretty significant steps have been taken and were taken by, by you. Uh, I, I appreciate that. And, and, I, and I don't disagree with anything that you've said. I, I will say, though, that it, it's felt as an observer, you know, and, and as a participant, mm -hmm. that it has been a little piecemeal, and, I, and I'm not sure that that approach is, is sufficient. In fact, I feel like it's not sufficient. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner, we, we do agree that there's a real crisis, and of course, I, we've been part of this conversation and the partnership and through your representative also, a, a TLC been sharing a lot of data and a lot of input on the yellow taxi medallion task force. We do agree that they have been, that we face a, a real crisis that affect the yellow taxi industry, right? Absolutely. We do also, how can you describe also the crisis affecting the library basis based in your own experience on one that have institutional knowledge of the transition from the moment when there used to be 40,000 drivers affiliated with Libre to the number going down to less than 20,000. How can you describe that crisis? Because what I feel is that, as I say, if you ask me today, I don't have one yellow driver as my constituents in Northern Manhattan. I don't have one medallion owner as my constituents in Northern Manhattan. If, and it's still, those of you guys that work with the yellow, you know that I've been going extra mile at a point that sometimes is taking a lot of heat in the effort to level the playing field. Because for me, this is about justice. For me, this is about helping the industry, all sectors of the industry. So I think that the city of New York right now, everyone, if you talk about crisis on the taxi, everyone is look on, yes, the yellow. No one is thinking about the dozen of liberal bases that they've been closing. No one looking at first class, Riverside, high class, Audubon, Dagman, that they used to have 600 drivers and they only had 200. 
So no one thinking about, you know, how when we started with a few dozen of vehicles and now we have more than 100,000 citywide. So there's more vehicle than the market outside there. So how can you describe mm -hmm. that crisis that you have seen based on what you have heard, based on the data that you've been able to look at TLC that is affecting the delivery taxi industry? I, th I think um, it looks somewhat like the impacts on the yellow industry look, and I think you're right. We spent time focusing on the yellow industry with the task force, and I think this is good. The task force for the livery is a good idea to help focus our attention on this area. Um, we have obviously been working and looking to see what is going on with livery. I think the facts are as the industry represents them. The, since the introduction of the apps in New York City, the number of vehicles that are affiliated with bases has decreased. Um, there's always a certain amount of bases that open and close, but the net loss in bases is something um, that has gotten higher. So, you know, we've lost many more bases. We've lost more bases in the last 10 years than have opened. Uh, we've seen somewhat recently that the types of bases that close, it's not someone, a new entrant who maybe was in for a year or three years, but we're seeing some of the real the longer term bases that were the anchors of the community and maybe have been in existence for 10 years, 20 years, those are also starting to close. We've also seen, um, although there are more drivers available than ever before to drive for livery, uh, we see um, that the competition from the apps has meant that delivery bases and the traditional black cars sometimes struggle to retain drivers so these are the these are the elements of of the problem that the livery industry is facing today okay. my colleague here represent the area you know in the Bronx, and i'm pretty sure it's the same experience that i also have in northern manhattan again as you know being chairing this being a member of this committee from 2009 to 2013 and then being the chair, the, being a member and now being the chairman of this committee from 2009 to 2013 to today, except the, the year, the period of time where this four high vehicle was uh, separated and then it's back. You know that we've been in the table. I always push in coalition to see in the round table conversation. I want for different sectors to support each other. But I know, and as you know, that I'm a big proponent in 2014, I call for a bailout to the yellow taxi. I use the word, the word bailout in 2014. So to talk and have conversation about financial assistance and different type of mechanism that can be created is not something new that I've been putting on the table. As I also, you know, that I've been a big proponent to increase enforcement down 96 JFK in LaGuardia. So I highlighted again that when I talk about the situation in the South Bronx, the situation in Northern Manhattan, the situation in Queens, in other places. You know, both of us, Andy have Riverdale, you know, uh, Cabrera knows we share border. You know, Marble Hill is between us. Between we three, still it's between three. So we know if I would be a yellow taxi driver, the only reason why you would see yellow taxi drivers going to Riverdale or to Walton and Giron, Walton and, and, and Trimmon, is if I'm dropping someone there. Because the market is in the Midtown area. The market is, is in, in the JFK. The market is in LaGuardia. However, the liver doing the train of drugs and crack, you know, it was the liver who were there in the South Bronx. It was the Libra who was there in Washington night. It is the Libra who were there. But when I bought a Chevrolet, a Chevrolet Impala to be affiliated with TLC, I only had to go to Route 46 in Jersey mm -hmm. and buy it together with my brother-in-law for $1,500 and get like a $700 insurance and like a $300 permit TLC. And the radio in the car is ready, was ready to go out. 
It was less than $5,000 investments. Today, if you want to be affiliated with a Libre, if you want to be a Libre corporate black card, the investments is around $25,000. And when you look at the fare, it's not a big difference how much the fare was, $7 from Dagman to City College in the 80s to probably 15 now from the 80 to 2020. So, you know, how can we look, how can, how much, how do you think are the drivers affiliated with Delivery doing when it comes to the income they're making? How many hours do you feel based on the data that you collect from the basis they're working? And how much do you think that adding a potential additional income of $300 a month, if they will be able to use the roof or the car to advertise and inside the car will make a difference to those drivers. So I, I, I think that any amount of income is gonna make a difference in almost every driver we license. That's clear, we're, we're talking about people who are, don't make a tremendous amount of money and I, kn I know that extra income helps. What we're trying to do, what we wanna make sure happens is that with any legislation that that money actually gets to the drivers, I think if, I assume there's a lot of money in advertising. I'd, I'd rather that the companies themselves didn't hold all of that or that it didn't go to leasing companies or fleets, but that it actually went to the drivers. So that's, um, I'm very interested in getting more income for the drivers. I just want to make sure that it actually gets to them. Oh. So I, I think that we agree that, you know, those suggestions, recommendation that you brought to the table about concern about the bill, those are details that can work, work it out between the staff Mm -hmm. of TLC, City Hall, and us, and see how can we, you know, put things in place that, you know, have the driver's interest as a first priority when it comes to guarantee that most revenue that they will make go to their pockets to support themselves and to support the family. Have you been in contact with other, I mean, meaning TLC, with other major cities such as Chicago, which currently allow uh, for higher vehicles and taxis to engage in rooftop advertising? And how do you think, how are they able to manage this issue? But so far, you know, we are still have not been able to do it. That's a good question. I, I haven't been in touch with them on that issue. We do speak a lot to Chicago and to the other cities that regulate. So that's a question that we can ask them. That's a good idea to learn from their okay. experience. And I will assume that, again, the concern, uh, the legitimate concern, and uh, as the today being the first, the first hearing, we definitely we have to spend hours going back and forth on details of, about this bill. Mm -hmm. But we can agree, right, that that concern that TLC shared today are not related on any uh, data driving policy, but it's more concern in general. Well, some of the concerns are based on some of the I mean, some of the concerns are just are universal concerns about making sure that drivers actually benefit. Some of the concerns are based on looking at um, some of the contracts, proposed contracts and agreements we've seen um, for advertising and some of, um, and the fact that there will be many other companies entering this picture. So we don't really know who those are yet or what kind of business models they're gonna have. So we wanna make sure that whatever we do, you know, benefits drivers or vehicle owners. Okay. Um, and some of the concerns are based on our experience with Yellow Taxi where, you, you know, the drivers don't benefit from the advertising uh, in Yellow Taxi. Okay. Well, what other, and, and again, I, I welcome the, the, the suggestion. What other suggestion, what other ideas have you, if there's any that you can share with us, do you feel we should explore to help the delivery basis and their drivers that they and the corporate black car that they are struggling today. I think um, you know. I think it's about trying to reduce. It's about increasing pay, but it's also about reducing expenses, which gets you to the same place. Um, I think it would be good to take a look at what some of the more common expenses are and whether there are ways to reduce them. Maybe that's insurance costs. If there's some way to get those costs down for drivers. Okay. Voy a decir en español, lo voy a decir en inglés también. Hace años yo he estado pidiendo que se le dé una deuda a los choferes libres 
que tienen tickets acumulados por recoger en los lugares del sur de Bronx, del norte de Manhattan, fuera de la área central de Manhattan. Creemos de que el servicio que proveen esos lugares no lo provee nadie más y nosotros esperamos poder trabajar en algo que por años lo hemos estado pidiendo. Uh, as you know, Commissioner, for uh, this is a thing that I've been asking, uh, I've been asking TLC for years uh, to the former chair, Sochi, and others, and the team on how can we look at the possibility to give a forgiveness of debt to drivers who are affiliated with Libre Basis that they own money because of picking up in the outer borough area where residents in those communities, they don't have another mode of transportation where they had to walk 15 blocks from the train station to the apartment or the house where they live. And as you know, we've been talking about, mm -hmm. have you made some, and, and if we had to, you know, yes, get the answer in another moment, we will more than happy to not put on hold, but is there any information that also you can share with us about, you know, what is the debt uh, and, and how can we explore the possibility to work on that? So I, I think you have to, you, and we have, had, we have had these discussions. I think you know that I and the agency have pretty strong views about illegal street hails and street hails. I think that um, it, it may be that there are ways to focus more on education for licensed drivers who do, who do illegal street hails at least the first or second time. I think the problem of unlicensed drivers remains a really serious public safety concern and that's throughout the city. I know that when we have stopped unlicensed drivers, whether they're in unlicensed vehicles or whether they're actually in a licensed vehicle that someone has let them use, uh, we often find people with significant criminal records that and so they would not have made it through our background checks. So I, I can't ignore those problems and concerns because we have to be worried about the safety of drivers and we have to be worried about the safety of passengers. I think in terms of looking at, in terms of looking at enforcement, I, I, I would suggest that this is, is sort of one of the major topics that would be under consideration in the task force. Okay. Uh, I more than happy, I, I, I just feel that you know, sometimes I have stopped at Pier 83, at 42nd, and, and waiting for some friend of mine there. And when I'm there and to see like, a number of drivers that they know, one did a pre-arrangement, and that's one of those markets that should be used for the yellow, or for an individual that they use pre-arrangement with the Uber and leave and the other 73 at company using the technology. But not a space, it's not, it should not be a space for any driver to go there asking passengers, do you need a taxi? When those uh, are not yellow or no one did a prearrangement with the app. So I all about enforcing there. So when we have many cases that you heard the story about luxury building, you know, and sometimes, you know, some drivers passing by that they are not yellow and making some relationship and you know ap approaching the people that are coming out using whoever to be able to provide those individuals that they are coming out from the luxury apartment with again a services that was not pre-arranged through the apps or neither is a yellow so i think that there's a market is it now 96 and this is something again i hoping to we will explore that but I think that when we have so many areas down 96 in the JFK, where we need to deploy the enforcement on TLC, there should not be one person from TLC sent to the South Bronx because they need to get a number of tickets. There should not be no one, you know, in Washington Heights. You know, if we will say we have enough and we are covering every corner here, but when you landed from DR with a warm weather, we would love to be in the Caribbean, and you landing in the JFK, and you are coming out 
and immediately you're being approached by people, do you need a taxi? And of course, this is something that also we discussed yesterday with the chairman of the Port Authority on how they also can increase enforcement in those areas. So that the yellow, for those who landed that they didn't do the pre-arrangement with the 75 Uber, Leave, Bia, and the other 72, for the rest to be yellow. So when we have so many areas, I just say one more time, there should not be one person from law enforcement on TLC. There should not be one in Third Avenue and treatment. There should not be no one affording there. We are doing exactly what one of the bills we are not being able to pass it. I have a bill that is calling, it's not about TLC, but I have a bill for years that is calling for the city of New York to let drivers to park the car after sanitation clean the street. Makes sense. And the only reason we have no pass it is because we make like a $30 million by giving tickets to those individuals. So for me, this is about, again, it can be there, but I hope that things like that, if we can establish some level of flexibility and priority, I will be calling TLC to deploy, and if you can share with us, I think it's around 200 and, and men and women that we have enforcement to be, yes, focused on 96. That's what the yellow need help. The yellow doesn't need help for anyone to be doing enforcement in the South Bronx, in North Manhattan, in Queens, in Brooklyn, in Staten Island. So, you know, can we explore, you know, even though we will, can discuss at the task force, but can we make some plan to see how we can address that situation? We can certainly discuss, and I know we've had this discussion. I think, you know, I, I disagree with you on the need for enforcement above 96th Street. We've got 500,000, we've got a million trips a day, 500,000 are at the airports and in, the conge in Midtown, but another 500,000 are throughout the city. And we do have to, it's not just about protecting yellow taxi drivers, it's about protecting passengers as well. And we do have to make sure that unlicensed drivers are not out there operating and, and picking up passengers because that's a, that is a risk to public safety and I, I can't I can't not think that and I can't not say it. Um, it, it continues to be a risk to public safety. Um, I, dis I disagree with you. I, I disagree with you. I and I call for City Hall to establish some announce some level of flexibility. We have decided that even with the street vendor that we still will be in conversation to lift the numbers of street vendor, but there have been some understanding on some level of flexibility. It's not about safety, Commissioner. It's about priority. Where the where the yellow? Do we want to do we want to balance today? You know what we heard from anyone on the yellow? What is the solution on this part of the solution? Enforce 96 below 96th Street. Enforce a JFK. And we, There's corruption and we, going on. There's corruption going on inside the Port Authority, inside the JFK. The only way, and this is not on you, this is not about TLC. But there's a big network there. That's the only way on how, if you go to JFK today, you will see men and women inside the JFK. It's a whole structure. They have people different way, different places, in the corner, sending signal. It's like a cartel inside the JFK, the way of that, and that's happening on the our watch. <laughs> if you go to one police plaza today, and you do the walk, and you go behind the screen, NYPD know any movement that happened down Canal Street. If you go to JFK, because if they don't do it, then we're not safe. They should know every single movement. So again, a sign saying, let's be work together on the flexibility in the uptown area. I also say, let be, let's send a zero tolerance to anyone that do illegal pickup at JFK in LaGuardia. 
I agree with you on the problem at the airports. It's absolutely a problem. I'm glad you had that conversation with the Port Authority. We're also meeting with them. This has been a series of ongoing conversations with them. We have different levels of success in getting access to the terminals at LaGuardia and JFK. We definitely, everyone who goes to an airport knows and has to agree with you that there is a problem there and that there are people there posing as licensed drivers or as taxi drivers. They're holding up a sign that says Uber and they're just we don't know who those people are, but we know they're not licensed drivers, and we know that they are in a situation where they can gouge the passengers and they can do a lot of other things to the passengers, and it's not a good situation. Um, the construction has been a serious problem in terms of everyone's ability to maneuver there in deployment, but we absolutely target our resources at Midtown, and we do target them um, at the airports. I would just say something I've said before, which is in the last five years, the number of vehicles has doubled and the number of drivers has doubled, but the amount that TLC has collected in fines has gone down by 30 percent. So we're, we're not out there doing this to make money. We're out there enforcing, and it's the public safety and it's passenger safety, but we're not trying to, if we're trying to make money, we're not doing a very good job because despite the fact that there's double the number of enforcement targets, our revenues for enforcement have gone down significantly. the playing field and address how the yellow taxi driver been losing a lot of riders, those numbers are mainly in the Midtown area. The yellow are not losing riders in the South Bronx. The yellow are not losing riders in Uptown. The yellow are losing down 96. We agree with that. We agree with that. I think where, yeah. we, disag I think where we disagree is I don't see enforcement as just about helping yellow taxis. I see that as a goal of helping all of our licensees and the licensed drivers, but also helping protecting passengers. Yeah, and, 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 and I don't think that if you go to Dagman Street and Broadway, I would like to invite, you know, TLC to have a walk together and to, with all, all of us who represent, in this case, the Bronx and Washington night, and be standing at a corner and thinking about a teacher that come out from a school who there's no one yellow passing by because the demand and the markets, they are not for the yellow. So my thing is about the city has established a lot of level of flexibility in different area. And even though you've been a nice, and I can say more than happy to work with you, I always believe that you could be a great commissioner too. But I think that, you know, that part related to that issue, I'm fed up and I'm tired because even though every time that we ask to look at that situation, it's about we're looking at it. We need action. You know, los choferes libres están cansados, se sienten hostigados, se sienten maltratados, se sienten que proveen un servicio en un lugar donde nadie más lo hace. And as I believe also that, you know, we need to increase the salary to the men and women that they do enforcement on TLC. Again, when, what is, what data do we have about any driver that is affiliated with one of those bases who did a favor by picking out someone in area where there's no any other motor transportation? They shouldn't be a target commission. We should be, we have established hundreds of flexibility in different area. This is one of those that I'm calling today on TLC one more time. Let's focus all enforcement when it comes to a strict hill down 96 JFK and LaGuardia. And we're abs I'm absolutely willing to continue conversations and to look at ways, whether it's through the task force or otherwise, and talk about enforcement flexibility just withdrawal above 96th Street, I don't think that's flexibility. I think that that's, I think that that's going too far. But I think that in terms of deployment of resources and focusing on Midtown and the airports, we, we, we do that and we're happy to um, work with you more on that and, you know, make sure that we're going where the action is. Thank you. Councilman Cabrera. 
Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, just had a uh, follow-up question. At the airport, what kind of jurisdiction do you have, and what are you able to enforce at the airport? We're able to enforce TLC rules, and we're able to enforce, you know, we're able to enforce um, the traffic laws that we can enforce in other places. But, but what we're really looking at for at the airports is whatever you call it, poaching. People, you know, illegal pickups, people not going to the hold lot where, where they should, where, they sh you know, people. Do you guys do undercover turn. work? At the airports? Yes. Uh, there are There is undercover work at the airports. Because I, you know, I had the, the same experience where I've yeah. been approached, and I had never seen a TLC uh, inspector there. Is there a particular reason why that's the pattern? I don't know which time you were there which or which terminal. We do have people stationed at JFK. We're trying to get people stationed at at LaGuardia. So we do have dedicated squads that, that are there. Um, we're more likely to be outside the terminals and inside the terminals. The Port Authority Police Department also has the authority to enforce these and we do join operations with them. We have regular meetings to encourage them to do this. I think it's really more, it's really in the Port Authority's interest to do this type of enforcement because it is not a great passenger experience. I think you know when you come off the plane and very annoying. This, and it's not good for traffic. It's annoying. It's a bit scary. Sometimes it's very forceful. Um, I, you know, I had the same experience and they get shocked at one point when I tell them, look, I'm a New York City Council member. Why are you doing this? Uh, which, you know, they get startled, but the, there's nobody there to say, hey, you know, look, look what's going on here. And they do, I mean, it's like, it's not just once, twice, you know, I had instances where I had to wait uh, a while to be picked up and it's it just like they continue, you have a point person that, that has, you know, connections to whoever is gonna come. Um, I would imagine that it, it wouldn't be that difficult uh, to be able to single them out. And that's why I'm a little confused why it's not causing enough fear in them mm -hmm. to say this is not a good business practice. It's going to cost me too much. So this is an ongoing. This is an ongoing uh, frustration of ours. Some of it does rely on getting access into the terminals and being able to enforce on Port Authority property. We've had more luck at one airport than the other, but we're working through those issues with them. Um, I think it's important. Uh, the Chair Rodriguez had that meeting with the Port Authority. I know that, I, I believe I have a meeting with the Port Authority on this topic this week, if it's not next week. So we have to keep, we have to keep hammering that home. Um, they've also, as you know, they've proposed access fees at the airport for yellow taxi and for livery. And part of what they've said, if they collect those fees, is they would be improving, you know, the driver experience. They would be improving facilities for drivers. And they would also be improving the dispatch system so that yellow taxis are dispatched much more efficiently. I think a big part of the problem is that the drivers are sitting in the lot and while they're sitting there and not being deployed, there's passengers and that creates an opening for other operators who come in. So Council, uh, Chair Rodriguez referred to um, problems of corruption with ring, you know, rings of people who are intercepting passengers. Those are, those are absolutely problems. Um, I, what I would suggest is uh, that Deputy Commissioner Diana Panetti, who I think you've met with, but I, yes. I think it would be good if, if we could arrange a meeting with her and with you and with Chair Rodriguez to talk specifically you know, about enforcement, but we can also put a big emphasis on enforcement at the airports, and we can talk about enforcement citywide. I welcome uh, that meeting. I think it will be, Mr. Chair, I think it will be very productive. Uh, to get that done, because I'm into next steps uh, of action. Uh, I don't want us to come back here uh, at another hearing, and we're still in the same position. So the sooner we can do that, uh, I definitely uh, will welcome that. I'm just curious, do you know how many tickets are given above 96th Street versus below 96th Street? I don't, 
I don't have that here. Can we get that information? Yes. Because uh, that, that data will speak loudly as to uh, what is taking place. And if you could give us uh, also a breakdown by borough so we know where is it more, most active. I would imagine you could get it by borrow, right? In terms of, in terms of tic where tickets are issued? Yes. Okay. I, I just want to make sure that not certain communities that are being targeted. Uh, it will make sense. <laughs> it will make sense because I, I chair governmental operations, and we're going to have a hearing regarding uh, ticketing. Same thing is happening in sanitation uh, department where communities of people of color are being overly uh, ticketed compared to other communities. I mean, it's plain, I've seen uh, the data, and I, I just hope that that's not happen, uh, happening with the TLC, uh, uh, that, uh, that they're being targeted. So I'm, I'm gonna be uh, very open-minded until I see uh, the data uh, showing uh, where it's being targeted. My last question, i close with this. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for, for the time here, is, and I know you're the interim uh, commissioner right now, and there's a transition that's gonna be taking place, but right now, what do we have like a master plan in action as to what we're gonna do next? Uh, what, a plan that is going to guide us, or are we waiting for the next co commissioner uh, to come in and then a plan is going to be established? I think what we've been, you know, what we've been working on for the last few years and certainly in the last year and a half have been, a, a lot of the priorities have been set for us by you, by City Council. There was a tremendous amount of legislation in August of 2018, uh, later in December, and then I think early in 2019 and that set forth, for example, a study on congestion, a study on driver pay, a medallion task force, we'll have the livery task force. So we have been um, looking systematically at different parts of the industry and at different issues. Mm. I, I had an opportunity to, to talk to uh, uh, the candidate uh, for, for the next commissioner. Um, Looking forward to those hearings and see. Um, I had many questions uh, put forth, uh, and and hopefully we could tackle some of these things. Last question uh, related, and I forgot to ask: Do we need legislation to help TLC dealing with those who are not licensed doing uh, the illegal activity at the airports? I think we have the authority now. You I have the authority. We need more legislation. Okay. I think the question is. I don't want to get to, uh, the question is getting, may, having consistent authority at both airports at each terminal for TLC to go onto the premises of Port Authority, those leased properties, and making sure that we have full access to that and that we can enforce in those premises. Well, you have that authority right now. By law, do you have that authority? We have law? to. We've, we have to create agreements with the Port Authority to get on that, to be able to get in there and to enforce. But what about if we write a piece of legislation that would automatically give you access? Uh, that would be good. I'm not sure. Again, I don't want to get too in the weeds. I'm not sure if City Council can. I'm not sure that what local law can do with respect to Port Authority authority over their lease premises, although ultimately the city owns the property, so that's something to look at. Yeah, that's what, that's what I was, I was going to get at. I mean, you own the land. Yes. We own the property. So we I'm should be uh, really have the power to determine. And, and so I'm looking forward to that conversation and really trying to empower for you to be able to to help the taxi drivers who pay their monthly, mm -hmm. you know, dues and yearly dues and, and, and they go by the book, you know, here comes somebody else who wanna, you know, circumvent the process. Thank you so much, uh, to, uh, Commissioner. If I don't see you again in this position, thank you for all your work. Thank Appreciate you, it. Gentlemen. Thank you. Commissioner, how many uh, men and women do we have today uh, enforcement for TLC? It's 
It, I think you had said 200. It is, it is around 200, but that, that includes administrative staff as well as the people out in the field, the number in the field uh, who are able to be out in the field in terms of the officers and some of the um, senior management is probably closer to, it's below that number, it's above 100. As I said, we just brought on a class in April and then we just brought on another class in November, we're waiting for all of them to get their special patrolman status so they can be out in the field. Okay, so I, I think that, and again, I, since this was not a top priority for this hearing today, but it's about the crisis, what to do. We asked a question, but if we can also get those information from your team about a breakdown on the numbers of tickets given citywide, mm -hmm. how many have been given to the out of order and mm -hmm. which one, how many to the down 96th Street, how many uh, men and women have in, in doing enforcement and the breakdown also in area that they've been deployed. Uh, one thing that I want to be clear is that cracking down on only on licensed drivers is something that we've been advocating for years. So we do agree that, you know, it, it, we should have zero tolerance for uh, anyone that is a, a driving a, a, a what it, they can call a taxi or a libre, but it's not if they don't have the license. So cracking down on licensed drivers is not the same as, as we are calling for the TLC to be more flexible to many women who they, they affiliated with the basis and they respond to a demand that we have in area where they don't have yellow, that they just, again, those bases that I'm mentioning, it, it, that they are in those community. So I just want to be clear on that part that is now. Thank you. Uh, and regulate license uh, uh, should happen independently of a street hailing, which is a two different uh, approach. Uh, one question again, thinking about, and probably that's gonna be things related to a, a task force, a identifying idea suggestion, but let me take advantage also to advance the conversation. Do you think that it's possible to do a pilot project where we, we mean TLC, you guys, the city, work installing some electrical charges, taking like a three or five spot in front of those base, the library bases, so that also we can provide incentive to the bases that they can attract drivers who are into electrical mm -hmm. a, a, Car? Um, I don't, I hadn't heard this idea before. It sounds like a very intriguing idea and obviously battery electric vehicles is an exception to the vehicle license cap. I, it's, it's Department of Transportation is really, has been taking the lead in terms of expanding chargers and, and battery electric vehicles. So I think um, it would be good if we had this conversation, but if we had, if we included DOT as well, I think they have the, the resources mm -hmm. and the know-how? I, I just, you know, I feel issue. that, yeah, I just feel that we should also think about going green when it comes to the car. Mm -hmm. And as you know, there's some incentive for a individual that they would like to get into the electrical vehicle a, at the federal level and some, I think, at the city level that it will reduce, I think, that the cost of those vehicles like from 40 to 30,000. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that if we can do some pilot project identifying, you know, few spots close in front of the liberal bases, and even if we have some public parking that, you know, that can be designated yes, for, you know, the taxi for individual affiliated with liberal and corporate other sector interesting into going getting into electrical car, I hope that again that we can, you know, discuss with you DOT and City Hall. Okay, thank you. Okay. I think it's an interesting idea. Thanks. Council Member Cook, please. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner, thank you for coming uh, to testify before us. Uh, you know, driving a taxi or driving a liberal car is an honorable job. Many successful people came here and start driving a taxi or a limousine or, or a liberal cab. 
Um, and then later on, they make money and then become very successful to another business. So we should uh, do our best to help all these uh, drivers, right? especially the new immigrants. And I don't see why TLC will oppose uh, advertising uh, inside the car or even outside the car. Uh, because you do it on taxis, we are bombarded with advertisements everywhere we go. But you open your cell phone, there are lots of advertisements. You go to the bathroom, there's advertisements. You go on Times Square, you get all these neon signs, uh, advertisements. So uh, why we restrict advertising uh, in, um, for higher vehicles? I mean, right now is all these people, if they can make $200 extra or $300 extra, it will help them because the economy is not that good. Even on the surface, it's good. The unemployment is down, but it's really hard to make money. Uh, all the retailers are doing not doing well. Uh, I'm sure the, all the drivers too. So if we can do something that is not harmful to public safety, uh, why don't we do it? Thank you. I <laughs> Council member, before the commission has answered the question, what we heard from, from the commission is that they brought in numbers of suggestions, concerns, ideas, but they did not testify against it. They just feel that, you know, there's some question that had to be addressed. Yes, for, you know, okay. so, so work together and, and fine tune these uh, guidelines yeah. for them to. Uh, yeah, to that's, what they are not, that's, that's what yeah. I heard from the commissioner. It's not TLC didn't come say here today, we support her, but neither they say we are against it. What they say, there's a number of questions and suggestions, and, suggestions, and that should be addressed. I'm sorry, I wanted to be yeah. clear. That's right. Yeah, we. I, I, we, we flagged different concerns with it. The overall concern, Councilman Ku, is just to make sure that there are benefits, there are financial benefits that are being suggested would be available to drivers or to vehicle owners. We just want to make sure that they get those and that there are safeguards in place to make sure that any benefits really go to them and not to the advertising companies or to the apps, but to the people who actually need it. Sure. I think he had a phone call. Muchas gracias. Y disculpe. Um, hi. Good, after, good morning, Council. Good morning. And, you know, I, I think that what I want to ask about is really the relationship between TLC, the drivers, and the concept of, of advertisement. And, mm -hmm. and I, you know, looking through your testimony, I really saw uh, has a lot of hesitation mm -hmm. to really open that space up through what I'm imagining is information that you've gathered so far from, from all the multiple, uh, all the multiple kind of driver relation, uh, the driver pieces, yellow cab, green, for hire, et cetera. And so I guess what I wanna know is, 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 there, is there a real study behind the decisions and the hesitation that we can kind of see together and, and just understand the, the component of, of advertisement. And the reason I'm asking this mm -hmm. is 
we've been experiencing a lot of a lot of fatalities in the city, deaths that are related to doors opening. And so I want to bring in another conversation about how we advertise things like watch when you open the door. And those aren't uh, kind of funding related advertisement, but do they have a relationship here in this conversation where we can, we can work with the industries to build awareness campaigns around opening doors that might cause a biker to hit? And so that, that's one thing that kind of popped up for me, and maybe that can help move the conversation and, and, and think about multiple things at the same time. So I just wanted to see if that was provocative for you at all. Commissioner. Thank you, Councilman. Um, to answer the first part of your question, uh, the, the concerns that we raised, that I raised during the testimony, one, just a flag that, you know, the city does litigate, has litigated in terms of the city's ability to regulate advertising in the public space, and this is not just a TLC issue. The city has enforced in other contexts, for example, the, um, the, uh, the barges uh, on the river with the advertising, et cetera. So we, I do want to say that there are larger city concerns here about just the city's ability to do that type of regulation. But obviously, in terms of getting more money to the drivers, uh, we definitely support that. I'm interested in that. The concerns that I brought to the table, it's not, it's not a question of having done a study. It's just a question of, in the time I've been there and the time other people at TLC have been there, many companies have come to the table and said, we have this thing, and this is gonna change your life, and this is gonna help you. You know, the, the, the biggest example is with the apps. You're gonna make 80,000, you're gonna make 90,000 a year. Well, that didn't really happen. And then, but and that's then obviously the, that's we the have driver. a lot of smaller groups. So what, I, I'm, I don't mean to interrupt you, but just if I could finish the thought. We always have to say, is this going to, this, this, benefit that's being promised to the drivers. Is it real? Because before we regulate and allow it in or preclude it, we want to make sure that the drivers or the vehicle owners are actually going to see the benefit. And it's not just another example of people making money on the backs of the drivers um, and the drivers themselves not seeing that benefit. Got it. And I, and I get that too. And that was pretty laid out uh, in terms of the kind of legal and uh, stuff that needs to happen that might not actually put the drivers at the front end of a, of a, and a recipient for, for the, the, the extra revenue, and, and I get that. And so I hope that this hearing and the conversations that happen kind of offer opportunities for the drivers to do that, and I think that's on the drivers to figure out how they're gonna really make the point to bring in that revenue to them, because that's really the pressure point here that I think everyone's trying to figure out, and this is an idea. Mm -hmm. um, and then now, pivoting to the other piece, yes. uh, the, the kind of public awareness yes. announcements that need to happen. And I know we've had conversations before about this in terms of how we bring more safety and bringing decals inside, which is a form of advertisement through um, messages for, tr for passengers to be careful when they open the door, because they might cause mm -hmm. uh, a real potential fatal situation. And so, do those things come together at all? Do those things have relationship? And well, can we have that conversation with, with our community about how we can do that together? I think you raise a really interesting point. One, I think, you know, we are one of the lead Vision Zero agencies. We do do a tremendous amount of work with the other agencies, but also with the different transportation safety groups in terms of, and the education we do with our drivers in terms of trying to raise awareness about bikers, about pedestrians, about other vehicles, about the best way to check for them, encouraging the passengers to always check before they exit a vehicle so that they don't, um, a, a bike, they don't collide with a biker. At that moment, um, there are um, stickers and decals that we have made available. We haven't mandated it, but we have made it available to four higher drivers. Um, and th those are at our uh, inspection facility in Woodside, Queens. I think one interesting point is when, if you look at the interior tax uh, advertising that's in taxis, the city gets 
a piece of that content, not a, not a financial benefit, but the city is able to use a portion of that content for public service announcements. And I think you may have seen, there, there have been some that have been TLC specific. Um, there was a service refusal video that we did with Speaker Mark Viverito. There are, there are other, uh, there's currently like a buckle up video. So there's things that we do in the space and that might be something to look at with this interior advertising legislation about retaining for the city some real estate in whatever ad content occurs in the cars because if it's going to happen, the city should be able to leverage that space for you know for public safety reasons and along the lines of what you're saying thank you for that and and i think that's what i wanted to invite in this conversation and in this space is to really think about how we work together to do the kind of public service announcements uh different and 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 to kind of build build that in potentially into the legislation but the second thing is in the current yellow taxi cab uh, real estate that you have in the cab through the video. Uh, I remember Melissa Mark Viverito talking about IDNYC and the buckle up pieces. And and so is, is that is that revenue that you offer to the cab as well? So is that a payment? Is that a you pay for that or is that just like no, an understanding? City, it's a we the city bargain for that space. We don't we don't pay for that space. Got it. So just part of the larger city contract. has to pay to create the content but we don't have to, we don't pay for that space. Okay, great. Um, again, I'm just thinking out loud, how do, we, how do we have a discussion about whether or not that changes in this space where, where that's a opportunity for, for revenue for, for drivers. Um, I, don't know what, I don't know what will happen, but I, I just wanted to start the conversation in mm -hmm. terms of some other public policy goals mm -hmm. and to have everybody at the table to discuss it. And that's really the one thing that I wanted to throw out there that might just change the way that we think about this together. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. So, uh, thank you for, you know, your being here with an open mind. I know that we've been working with this uh, for years, and I know that all of us care for the future of the taxi industry, an industry that, as we say, is yellow, is corporate black car, but the high volume black car, they are delivering. And at some point, as we have done it before, we will have a round table conversation with all the sector. Everyone had to do their part. I feel that, as I said before, a city of 65 million tourists, 8.6 million residents, provide opportunity to everyone. Uh, I have been a livery taxi driver. I've been there for the yellow. I understand the importance to work with a high volume uh, uh, ad and the corporate too. Uh, but I also feel again, I have a moral responsibility to also stand up for the livery as I had a stand up for the yellow and es mi responsabilidad estar ahí para los choferes que son libres, para los choferes que están en black car, para los choferes que están buscando. You know, this is the American dream, commission. Without that, I would not be able to move from being a washing dishes at Old Henry restaurant at West 4 and 6th Avenue in 83, and be able to do all the job and then end up driving a taxi and be able what we're here today. So behind any drivers who's here, not only they are supporting the soul, but they're raising the next doctor, and they're raising the next engineer, and they themselves also are working and going to school. And I think that you know the city had to stand up. The city had to help to deal with you know, the, this crisis. I say, the agency of TLC should be expanded. You know, it's like one of the smallest agencies that we have, and I'm not going to put you in a spot. This is myself as a council member. You know, the agency grow on the demand. You know, and every day there's new case. There's a Libra, there's a Black Card, there's an Uber, there's an application. 
and I think that you do the best you can. But it's different when you have someone in charge of a department and that person has 25 individuals under their responsibility to be able to look at the data, to be able to coordinate enforcement. So I think, again, that we, from our end, we also need to look at this as we are starting negotiating the budget to expand resources. And it's not to put in resources to send, again, we will be in different side, to send a TLC enforcement to area where there's no other motor transportation. But to add, and for, to add resources to provide, you know, services, connecting the drivers with benefit. They don't have a pension plan. We can create a pension plan. They don't have insurance. We should create insurance. You know, this is men and women that they contribute a lot. And there's model already. They have the limousine business that some of them, they are structured in a way that everyone that is affiliated with them, they have insurance. They have benefit. They have a salary that they also have guaranteed. So I think that even though you, the driver who are affiliated with a base, they are independent drivers, but we, the city, had to share some investments. You know, I appreciate that you, we've been working together, and beside that TLC in Long Island City, in other places, you welcome the drivers and respond to any concern, but you, we made, as we met with a number of liberal basis owner and drivers, and we agreed that it was important to expand those services. And we had the last Wednesday of the month in Community Board 12 in North Manhattan, at 176 in Audubon, a day where from six to eight, there's staff from TLC listening to any concern that drivers have, any need that they have. And we need to continue having more resources. We'll be there next so that, Wednesday. Next Wednesday. So the TLC, if we, from our end, it's about getting those resources to have, as we have with the immigration, immigrant service that we have service in our office. You just imagine that we put the resources so that in each council member, TLC can send a staff, especially in those communities that we have in numbers of bases. So, you know, there's a model already that we've been working, I appreciate, but I, I think, again, that we have to keep working harder. It, I want to also to share, before we also call on the panel coming, that we will have two hearings, very important also, not necessarily in the TLC, but I also wanted to share this new thing that will happen, that involve, ¿cuáles son inmigrantes los choferes? How many of you are immigrants? Levanten la mano los choferes que son inmigrantes, que nacieron en otro país y que estamos en taxi. I'm one of those. We come from Asia, we come from Africa, we come from Latin America, we come from different places. So, so así es lo que somos. So, I also, beside on, and before you will go, I also want to take advantage of, advantage of the public to invite all immigrants or people that have compassion for immigrants. By the way, your family, they came from any place in Europe 100 years ago, you are as immigrant as my daughters are that they are born and raised here. So tomorrow we are introducing a bill that will reestablish the rights of immigrants with green card and working permits to vote in municipal election. It's a bill that, <laughs> it's a bill that together with myself, Carlos Menchaca, the chairman of transportation, and other 22 council members as a co-prime, the Immigration Coalition, the NWACP, the Black and Latino and Asian Caucus, the Progressive Caucus. We are challenging progressive leader in New York City to say if we are progressive and we challenge that guy in DC, let's show that we are progressive by reestablishing. Because at the late of the 1900s, and by the 1920s, still in Texas, people could vote in the state without be your citizen. So let's be ready because this also affects in a positive way, give the voice to close to one million New Yorkers to elect the leader so that they also will advocate for you. So tomorrow at noon, we will be introducing the bill here. And also on the 29, on another issue on transportation, 
we will have an oversight hearing, improving street and vehicle safety. That hearing will happen next week on the 29th. Uh, as you know, many people have been dying because crashes, especially involving trucks. Technology is there, the Trucking Association. We came to the round table, they've been open, they've been putting a lot of ideas, a lot of suggestions. So on the 29th, gonna be having this year and listening on more details on what are we doing today to work with a new technology for the city to work with new uh, renovation or intersection to make the street safety using the technology and DOT uh, improving intersection. So those are things related to transportation, those are things related to immigrants. And I appreciate again that the services that you have done. And I know that we have built for so many years if you decide to stay here in our city. So, gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So now with the public, I want to call Brenda Sestern. Tina Rubelin, Paul Glimmers, Aziz Bath, and Sira Angeles. Good morning, Brent. Chairman Rodriguez, members of the Transportation Committee. My name is Brendan Sex, and I'm the Executive Director of the Independent Drivers Guild, otherwise known as IDG. We are here to wholeheartedly support Intro 1730. Joining me today on this panel are some drivers who are going to help tell our story. The story of how app-based drivers, who despite the reforms passed by this council, and despite what TLC claims, continue to struggle to make a fair and livable wage. I'd also like to acknowledge the over 80 drivers that took the morning off to come and support this bill as well. To my IDG brothers and sisters out there. More than a hundred, and I'd also like to rec recognize Commissioner Heinzman for um, also supporting our amendment to this bill and supporting the rooftop ads for the vehicles. More than a hundred IDG members came before you that day to seek your help as we rolled out our new driver bills of rights to address these and other concerns affecting drivers livelihoods a week later thousands of our members temporarily closed down the brooklyn bridge and the fdr in protest and in response to tlc ignoring uber and lyft's commands i am pleased to know that the city council and especially the members of this committee have heard our pleas and a number of bills addressing the issues raised in our driver bill of rights are in the works Today marks the first hearing addressing one of these bills, and what we hope is the first of several bills to come before this committee to provide immediate and much needed relief to drivers. As many members of this committee know, through our discussions over the last few months, we believe intro 1738 is a very important measure that would provide app-based and livery drivers with an opportunity to supplement their income from driving. This is money that will go directly into the pocket of four high vehicle owner operators, not the base owners, not Uber, not Lyft, not fleet owners. This legislation will require that the Taxi and Limousine Commission issue permits to allow for exterior rooftop advertising on any type of for hire vehicle, provided that advertising is applicable to the laws. And these opportunities are currently only afforded to medallion owners, but not the for hire vehicle owner operators. This bill will provide for parity, equality, and a significant step in the fight for fair treatment. We were all dumbfounded in August of 2019 when the TLC took away this ability only from for hire vehicle drivers. Given the continuing struggles of four hire vehicle drivers continue to go through, this just added the insult to the injury. 
Intro 1738 corrects this injustice by affording four high vehicle drivers the opportunity to contract with TLC approved advertising companies for digital rooftop advertising to earn $300 per month, close to $3,600 per year in supplemental income. As, you, as you'll hear from the drivers themselves, this additional income will make a big difference in their lives. It can, ca it can cover any number of expenses, such as health insurance, which is not provided by the app-based companies, a month's worth of healthy groceries, or 100% of a driver's monthly fuel expenses. It is also important to note that this opportunity to earn additional income comes without any obligation to spend additional hours on the road, and as a result, will not increase congestion. It will, it will also allow hardworking drivers to bring home the same income while spending less time on the road and more time with their families. We also want to ensure that there are additional driver protections built into this legislation to ensure that drivers who benefit from this opportunity, not the app companies, not leasing companies, and especially not fleet owners. All drivers must be afforded this opportunity without undue interference from the exploitive nature of app-based or leasing companies. 80% of our industry drivers own their own vehicles, 20% lease. As you all know, our industry's drivers have major issues with predatory leasing. Therefore, while this legislation is currently drafted, will definitely benefit a majority of our drivers. We are less certain given the leasing industry's tendency to take advantage of our drivers about the rest. We would like to see an amendment to intro 1738 that provides TLC with the regulatory authority to ensure drivers are protected and not further exploited by preventing leasing companies as well as the app companies from either requiring or prohibiting drivers from obtaining rooftop advertising to ensure that any and all revenue derived from such advertising goes directly and fully to the driver at a fair and mutually agreeable rate. In speaking with some of you on this committee, another concern has been raised what I would like to address. We've spoken to a major rooftop advertising company, we believe we'll be at, at, uh, testifying here today, who currently provides exterior rooftop advertising to the taxi industry, and it's very clear the existing benefits to the ta taxi industry from digital rooftop advertising will not be diminished or diluted in this bill anyway. To the contrary, if advertisers and drivers are able to deploy rooftop advertising on both taxi cabs and for high vehicle drivers, the advertising coverage to advertisers would be expanded within the city and rooftop advertising becomes more attractive to the advertisers. For the past few months, our team has engaged numerous council members on this and other pressing issues and I'd like to thank Chairman Rodriguez for spearheading the effort to introduce this bill. I'd also like to take a moment to thank those of you who have chosen to stand with the IDG, our drivers and the working class New Yorkers by sponsoring and supporting this bill. It's clear that you all truly understand just how important this income will be for the drivers and their families. Your care is also demonstrated by the other issues on the agenda today with regard to legislation that would create a black car and livery task force. We applaud any efforts that would assist the uh, viability of this industry and help our brother and sister black car and livery drivers. We would only recommend that the legislation be amended to provide for driver and or driver labor organization on the task force. In closing, I want to thank committee, the committee for all the work you've done and all we have accomplished together over the last few years in providing relief to 80,000 working families, specifically the approval of landmark driver income and transparency legislation in 2018. And while this has provided some needed relief, the TLC's resu resulting regulations and their lack of enforcement has caused some real problems, whereby the full intent and goal of this legislation has still yet to be realized. More work needs to be done, but intro 1731 is an important and significant first step for the four high vehicle drivers in this community. I want to thank you for taking the lead on that, Councilman uh, Rodriguez. Good morning, and thank you, Chairman Rodriguez, members of the committee. My name is Aziz Ba. I'm a driver advocate, and most importantly, a driver myself. I'm a currently New York resident and have been an FHV driver for the past five years. I'm here to testify in support of Intro 1738 to ensure myself and the, driver and the drivers I represent have real independent economic opportunities we need to survive in this industry. In the wake of uh, the calendar restriction that uh, most of us are very familiar with, anyone know about the lockout? Which app-based companies actually have used to limit my abilities to earn a decent living? I'm looking forward to installing a rooftop advertising system on my car in order to earn some extra additional income. As an owner operator, the income earned through rooftop advertising means additional money that will, that 
will be able to cover the cost of my insurance. A much needed relief to reduce the stress associated with that monthly expense. Busy or not, I will have peace of mind knowing that I'm not going to struggle wondering how to pay my monthly bills. Having the opportunity to earn extra income doing the same exact thing that I normally do on a daily basis without adding extra tasks to perform is not only a relief, but a must-have option for drivers like myself. I have the same universal driver's license as any other for hire, livery, or taxi driver. I simply do not understand why a rooftop ad is only limited to some sectors of this industry. How fair is that? Why am I being denied the same opportunities that others have? $3,600 a year will be a much needed addition to my bottom line. I appear before you today not just as an owner-operator operator, FHV driver, but also a driver advocate. As an organizer uh, the, with the Independent Drivers Guild, I am constantly in contact with many, many, many drivers, my brothers and sisters. I hear and see firsthand the struggle that drivers face on a day-to-day -day basis. These hardships and struggles are all, I can assure you, directly related to a lack of decent income. Any extra cent a driver can earn is valuable and life-changing. An additional $3,600 a year, though it may sound like not much to some, will go a very long way in helping thousands of hardworking New Yorkers like myself earn a living wage. Right now, you have the opportunity to take an important step in improving the lives of drivers. Once rooftop advertising is allowed on FHVs, I hope to focus more on my family because I will have one less bill to worry about. So I strongly support intro 1738 and urge this committee and the council to pass this measure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all who sign on as sponsors of this bill. IDG drivers appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure and honor to be here before you, Chairman and the Transportation Committee, Idanes Rodriguez. Uh, thank you for putting this hitting together. We had spoken before about the need to address the crisis that we have in the livery sector of the industry, which uh, often, more often than not, is not recognized as a different a kind of segment within all the segments of, it, within the definitions in the TLC. There's black cars, there's luxuries, there is limousines, there's high volume bases, but there are liveries in our communities uh, that serve uh, the, the, the sectors where nobody wants to go. We've been there for decades, and this is an important step that has been taken by the Transportation Committee, as we stated in the last hearing, to ensure that we hear the concerns, that we have an opportunity to sit down and look at all the options and how to address the crisis that we are in. The same concerns that the drivers today express, they wanna make more money, they want better conditions of work, but they also want to ensure that this is not going away somehow, somewhere. We have seen our industry decimated since 2014, where we were 24,000 drivers and vehicles affiliated to our 508 bases. Today, according to the TLC, we have less than, fewer less than 10,000. This is a real crisis that has to be looked into the same way it was done uh, when it was to examine the crisis on the yellow medallion owners and the drivers. It is a great opportunity also to allow the drivers to make decisions where they can make more money and they can feel free, as one of them stated, that they have one less bill to pay. So I commend the Transportation Committee, uh, Chairman um, uh, Rodriguez, and all the members uh, of the City Council that are thinking how to provide to an industry in crisis and also how to take a step back 
and look at the issues. How can we improve not only the drivers and the businesses that were created by drivers? Because my dad, number 29 of Riverside, created a base that today is, exists. I'm a second generation. The members of our association, the majority of us, are second generation base owners, daughters and sons of drivers family members. My mom is 77. She's still at the base. She's still in the business with us. Uh, so we do have planted roots in our communities. We know the people around, and we know the drivers, and they're our partners. So therefore, we are here to uh, say that we identify very much with the issues of the drivers, but at the same time, we recognize that this is something that needs to be looked at in together uh, to protect what we have created in our communities uh, 40, 50 years ago. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Paul Klimas, and I am proud to testify before you today as a full-time for hire vehicle driver in support of intro 1738. As a native New Yorker born and bred in Queens, I know just how essential our hard work is in ensuring that the transportation needs of New Yorkers are serviced 24 hours a day, seven days a week. My testimony today will in part tell my story, but it will also shed light on how the TLC has taken money out of my pocket and the pockets of other hardworking New Yorkers. Over the course of my life, I have worked in many different fields. After college, I began working at the American Stock Exchange, a job which I chose to leave after suffering from PTSD due to my experiences on 9-11. Years later, I returned to school to earn a degree in nursing, but instead of pursuing a career in the medical field, I chose to begin working as a full-time for hire vehicle driver. I say this because I want to make something very clear. I love to drive, and I chose to drive. That's why I've made it my career. I love meeting new people every day. I love making sure my passengers get to their destination safely. And most importantly, I love the freedom and sense of self-ownership I get as an owner-operator. Unfortunately, every day it's becoming more and more difficult to survive in this industry. App companies continue to exploit drivers, and it often feels as though no one is looking out for us, despite all of the hard work we do to keep the city running. Nowadays, I work more hours than ever before and still struggle to make a living wage, a standard we should not be forced to fight for, but are being forced to nonetheless. I am here today not just to share my own story, but to encourage this committee and the entire City Council to pass Intro 1738. Before the TLC's abrupt ban on rooftop advertising on four high vehicles, I was earning much needed additional income every month just for having a screen installed on the top of my car. I drove no extra hours and was earning an additional $300 per month, nearly 5% of my salary. For the first time in a long while, I found myself in a position where I was able to afford health insurance. And I don't need to explain to anyone how critical access to health insurance is for, one well, for one's well-being. I finally began and ultimately found a plan I could cover the cost of using the money I earned through rooftop advertising. Now that I've been forced to remove my screen and that additional income has been eliminated, I have to spend many more hours on the road every week just to pay for my health insurance. To be frank, the TLC's reversal of this issue is not just bizarre, it's insulting and hurtful. Though to some it may seem to be a simple policy decision, in reality it's something deeply personal that is affecting the livelihoods of thousands of drivers across the city. I, as well as all of the drivers here today, want to continue doing what we enjoy in serving the city. But to do so, we need the TLC to stop taking our money out of our pockets and stop implementing policies that hurt drivers. Today, you all have the opportunity to do something that can significantly change lives of thousands of hardworking New Yorkers. Pass intro 1738 and allow all of us to earn the money that we deserve. Thank you for your time. Good morning, Chairman Rodriguez and members of the committee. My name is Tina Ravino, and I currently live in Brooklyn and have been a for-hire vehicle driver 
for nearly three years. Today I speak from my personal experience as an FHV driver and also as a representative advocating on behalf of my fellow drivers throughout the industry. I'm here today to call on this committee to approve intro 1738. I entered the I entered the rideshare industry because of the flexibility and freedoms it promised. As a single mother, raising my 11-year-old son, the, raising my year old son the, the, the assurance of determining my own schedule allows me to spend time with my son. Unfortunately, the app-based companies which I drive for have made it increasingly difficult to earn the living my son and I deserve and need to survive in New York City. IDG has raised many of these issues drivers are facing with the members of this committee, such as destination filter, random deactivations, scheduled shifts, and predatory leasing practices, to name a few. While we look forward to working with you on addressing these issues, we're here today because we have a real opportunity to erase the hardship drivers face. Intro 1738 will afford FHV drivers the opportunity to earn an additional $3,600 per year without spending any time on the road and away from our families. This income will allow me to pay for my son's after school program. I find it very insulting that anyone who claims to be pro driver or pro worker would not support this bill very directly. But taking money out of our pockets of thousands of hardworking drivers, thousands of hardworking New Yorkers. As it stands today, FHB drivers across the city are being driven closer and closer to poverty lines. As the cost of living and operating in this industry is far outpaced in the income we earn. Today, I speak to you as my last resort as a struggling single mother asking for help. And I'm also an immigrant as well, so I know the struggle. I go through it every day. We have brought our concerns to the TLC, and they continue to ignore our plea for help. It's incredibly important that the council takes action to reserve TLC baseless ban on rooftop advertising and take an important step in providing drivers the livelihood we deserve. Please, please, I'm urging you and I'm begging you today to please pass intro 1738 and show us all that you truly, really do care about us and our families. Thank you. I, I just have two questions. First of all, my commitment is there, have always been there, uh, again, to all the sector. Uh, and, and I just have two questions, and then we will hear from the other panel. One is uh, especially related, and of course, the way of how we've been organized is, like, as you know, the IDG, you know, that represent uh, many of the drivers, most of the drivers who are here, the leadership, you know, speaking also on behalf of the drivers. And then we also have a member of the Liber Based Association, in this case also CIRA. And then we will also hear from some institutions, they have different point of view, and then we get back to a, a some representative of the private sector who has some idea that they can share how can they work based on their own experience, and then we will open to if there's any other drivers who are not necessarily associated on, with the IDG that also would like to say, make a comment with this. Saying that, it, 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 one of the questions for me is about, is there any evidence uh, that indicate that hailing confusion between for Ohio vehicles and yellow taxi with rooftop advertising system installed is a reasonable concern? Um. I appreciate the question, your leadership uh, on, on this issue. Um, as, as far as confusing for, for street hails, I would assume not. Uh, New York City cabs are distinctly yellow. They're known around the world, uh, not just here in, in, in New York City. They're an icon of, of this city. Um, uh, 
also, it's illegal for for our vehicle drivers to pick up street hails, and and our drivers know this uh, very clearly, uh, and do not um, pick up street hails. Uh, as as we kind of talked about before with the TLC enforcement, they don't want a TLC agent pulling them over and and giving them tickets. Um, so I, I I think it's a little um, dubious to say that there'll be there'll be some confusion on on, on hailing while while taxis are very clearly yellow and four hour vehicles are not. Um, you know, an ad on a rooftop isn't gonna, gonna force a driver to do something illegal, and it's, it's not gonna change a black Camry into a yellow uh, uh, New York City taxi. What has been the, the response that you have got from TLC uh, to the concern you are raised uh, regarding Uber and Lyft circumvention of the minimum pay rules? Um, we, we've been bringing this uh, to the attention of the TLC since, since June when Lyft started to circumvent the minimum wage rules. Um, and I believe in their, in their testimony over the last summer, they have began to change their language from, from the minimum, the hourly minimum wage becoming an average minimum wage. Um, they claim that they have no enforcement vehicle to, to make sure that drivers are being paid the minimum wage. Uh, again, they're, they're changing the language, making it an average minimum wage and not an actual minimum wage, which is sort of equivalent of saying, you know, the average Amazon worker is a millionaire, uh, considering Jeff, Jeff Bezos as well. Um, we, are, we are disheartened. Um, we are concerned that the TLC is uh, not, not taking this seriously enough and allowing these companies to do what they want when they want to do it, uh, with no concern to the driver's well-being. Okay. So I, I'm going to leave leave it there with those two questions because I don't want to get into, you know, on experience that uh, you could have discussing with TLC of why, you know, uh, they were not allowed up to this moment and instead of focusing on being positive, since they say that they were open to work together and, and, and address all those concerns. I think that I will assume that, you know, as uh, leaders of the IDG, you do understand that uh, we take it very seriously to be sure that when we say that this will allow, create opportunity uh, for drivers to earn around $300 a month, uh, additional uh, income that it can add to whatever they're making, that this is something that we will work with TLC, we will work with the advocate to be sure that a structure is in place to guarantee that it's not a, a, a stone guarantee that they will make in the 300, but it's about, it's about the procedure to be sure that, you know, any opportunity for the, for, the, for the private sector to come on board, we had to learn from previous experience and to be sure that the dollar goes to the driver. Is that something that we agree? Yeah, absolutely, um, and we're, we're pleased to hear um, Acting Commissioner Hines and agree with, with, with the uh, amendment that we're looking for to make sure that uh, not only the, the four hour vehicle owner operators uh, get the money, that, the, that the, the, the drivers that are leasing also directly get the money and making sure that the TLC has the regulatory authority to make sure that those drivers are getting, are, are getting the money. We 100% we agree that the drivers should be the benefit of this and, and no one else. And, and we've seen in the taxi industry, right, where the fleet, the, the, the mega fleet owners are making all the money on the, on the ads. And we wanna make sure that the drivers are protected here. Great. Okay. And to the drivers, you know, it is through organizing, agitating, and fighting in your own community in the city that you will get your right to be respected. You know, I always say, I always say I'm more organizer than being an elected official. And number talk louder than anything else. If you will be 20, he, 20 of you here, the attention will not be the same. People pay attention based on number, based on you mobilizing, you know, so. So, and I said, the good thing is my record has been very straight. I had taken a lot of heat, you know, from some of my liberal and Cedar knowing others and Elvin back there in my district. 
because I said before, and they were not here, Sita couldn't be here early before. I don't have one yellow taxi that I know that live in District 10. I don't have one medallion on it that live in my district. And I never give up one inch of the fight for the yellow because for me it's about fighting for justice. So when we pass all those laws, the universal license, creating more flexibility, flexibility, you know, on how the medallion owner is able, you know, to buy or sell the medallion, trying to incentivize, you know, the dynamic of the economy in the yellow. I had done it even at a moment where I was criticized because I feel it was the right thing to do, and that's what I would do. When in 2014, I called for a bailout, I was told, you crazy, how can we get the money, what mechanism can be in place, and I say, we did a bailout to real estate. We should establish, we should explore whatever mechanism is in place to provide some type of financial assistance. Let's not just marry with the word. Let's be married with the intention. So as I have been for the yellow, as I will be fighting for the poor authority, it doesn't take any recommendation. Enforce the law. Look behind the stream. Because if the poor authority, they don't know who is the every single individual that go in and out of JFK and LaGuardia, who go there, you know, spending hours, then New York City is not safe. So this doesn't take much, it doesn't take more roundtable conversation. It's only take an action. When we see individuals, they don't have license, picking up, dropping a passenger, regardless who they are, we condemn it and they should be out of the street. But at the same time, we also need to be there for the many women that provide the services, as I say, in places in this city that because of the market, because of the demand, because of where the 65 million tourists stay, because the economy that we have built that had not included the underserved community, we had the two economy on the taxi. The yellow in one area, they need to be protected, they need to be secure, and if some of the thing is about pilot projects, that we should, let's do it for the numbers of year, and let's see how it work. But I ask everyone, all the sector, to be open and compromise. As the yellow is bleeding, the liberal bases, the corporate black car, they're bleeding too, and they can die. And with that, I would like for Sita to explain about what is the dynamic, and I say a little things about the difference, when I used to be 112 of Bailey car service and Caddy car service, sometimes there was a passenger that they called and they didn't have the $7. And the dynamic is, yo no tengo el dinero hoy, te lo puedo pagar mañana. Can you explain a little bit about that community part on how the delivery drivers work, how they make arrangements with family to take their kids to school? That, how does it work? Well, um, thank you, Chairman Rodriguez. Um, I think that in the communities is a little bit different as you were explaining of the different sectors and how they work and where they concentrate based on the number of passengers that they can pick up in different, com in different areas. The yellows have been known to be in the central business district, as you pointed out, but we have concentrated in those areas, in the neighborhoods. Let's, let's talk about one, for instance, in the Bronx where the mother knows the, the bodega owner, but he, she also knows the community car service that's been there since she came to the United States 30 or 20 years ago. And now the kid needs to go to school and she cannot get out, but she knows that she can call the responsible party in that, in that base and say, can you do me a favor? Can you send one of the oldest drivers to pick up my son? Um, I'll call them in ahead of time, and then I'll pass by Friday and pay you. Uh, he's, she's not paying the driver, but she comes in with the notion that they understand that she is a person in need, and the same happens with 
ladies in the community when um, the sons or daughters have not delivered money to them and they said, my son or my daughter is gonna bring me money on Friday and I'll make sure that I pay you because I have to go to the doctor. We are not particular as to the $10 or the $20 that you have to give me to go to the appointment with the lady that takes care of you. We make sure that that person is covered. That's why we see that sometimes it's very unfair because many drivers feel that out of the need that it has been created for lack of, of, of a lot of transportation in the boroughs, and this is a discussion that we had in 2011 and 2010, um, about the need to have more affordable transportation that is easy and is safe and, is, and it provides all the safety uh, uh, measures that the central business district has. Uh, and that was one idea. It didn't work because we see today how it changed under, you know, how technology companies came in and in, in the dynamics and how we work have completely changed forever, both for the drivers and also for the business owners, for the small business owners. Now we have to be, for the first time in our lives, concentrate and work together. Something that that word 20 years ago, 10 years ago, was basically impossible to put two businesses competing for the same thing together. We created a platform just to get the pool of our vehicles together so that, let's say you call a base in Washington Heights, but there is a vehicle downtown to pick up. Somebody calls that he, she needs to pick up on 34th Street. If there is a vehicle from one of the bases, new family that operates some uh, around the district, that driver has the ability to pick up that call and take that lady back to Washington Heights. So, and back and forth. And that's the kind of service, and the same goes for the airport. One time, I, I, my mother came and I couldn't pick her up, and I call uh, one of the bases and they tell me that Bell Car Service had a guy that just dropped a passenger, that they were gonna send a call over, and then he brought my mother to New Jersey safe. So this is the kind of dynamics that we have, and that's why I think it is important, because people rely on the service that we provide. Many people come to work and there's no bus, there's no transportation that is safe at night. We are there because they know the local car service open 24 hours a day. So therefore, I urge this, this committee to continue to consider options for us to remain viable. So, and with that, it, again, it, we will continue working together with you and all the sector. And, and I urge, and, and before I finish with this, how many, based on what you know, how many liberal bases do we have in New York City? According to the TLC, um, it's uh, 439. We've seen almost 60 bases have to close their doors, um, especially bases that, that, that were formed by drivers, a group of drivers that got together and pulled their resources with their vehicles and, and worked. Some of them being owners of a business during the day and being drivers during the night. So this is the kind of, um, of effort that has been put in and sweat and tears that have been put in into this business. Okay. And I will assume that in your case, both of you guys can also uh, clarify that one of the concerns brought by TLC, which is about on the advertising, how can they keep track uh, of the advertising uh, tool and you know, one of the concerns that the commissioner brought was just about the data. How can they keep track of those data? I will assume that you I've, have to respond every day to a lot of requests of data in different matter related to TLC. I believe that there's a model that has been created for many years with the yellows. There is a model that was created, so to speak, to mimic that, uh, that creation, which was the greens. And now I think the TLC has a roadmap as to how to track these things. So this is nothing new. Uh, and I believe if it's done correctly, uh, with the driver's protection in mind, I think it will be a successful uh, thing f for the driver and for the community as well. Okay, so I would like to invite the 465, the 469 Th bases. 39. 39, to be involved, to organize, to come together, because as I told the yellow, it is by organizing that they will have a strong voice. So I think that, again, we will be able to 
put together in the next couple of months, not only the recommendation coming from the Yellow Task Force, but also recommendation that I hope uh, if we are able to move this bill with the support, again, with the speaker, my colleague, and City Hall, that we can be able to get rec a strong recommendation. And I also urge, you know, uh, uh, those uh, leaders of the industry, the labor industry, to also look at what happened when we created the task force. I know that when we were in the process of creating a task force, you know, because of all the negative experience and the urgency, what we heard from the yellow was, we cannot wait the six months. We cannot wait for that time of recommendation. Well, now everyone is on expectation on when the report will be released, which must be done by the 31st, based on the bill that I introduced and we passed at the council. So on the 31st, the report on the Yellow Taxi Medallion Task Force go to the speaker and to the mayor. So that will be kind of public document. And I know that there's a lot of expectation. The same thing will happen with the Libra and Corporate uh, Black Card Task Force. We will have a great opportunity to spend a period of time. However, we will not be waiting for those recommendations. We need to act now. As I said, there's a, the, uh, Chairman Rodriguez, I, I think it is important that you mention that because there's a sense of urgency uh, in our bases. And also drivers are hurting when they cannot re-enter. If they have a vehicle and they lose the license, which is some major concern that everybody has, if they lose their license, they have no way to re-enter the system, even if that vehicle was already there. And so I, I, I urge the, the council and the TLC to look at that and allow those drivers a mechanism to be able to re-register their vehicles because they are financed, they have to park them and they have to park them and pay for the garage and they cannot work and they have to resort in incurring all this cost and then renting a vehicle. I do believe that there should be a way and this will help the bases that have lost half of the stock of the vehicles without a mechanism to just bring those drivers back to work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, una pregunta. I have a question. Thank you, Chair. And uh, part of my conversation in the questions that I asked the commissioner earlier was about PSAs, and the tension point here is real, and, we, and, and you've laid out the case to really build more and additional revenue. The question is how, and so I'm, I'm learning. I'm not a, I'm not a driver, uh, but I'm in the city council. I'm here on the transportation committee, and I want to help, and I want to support, and so I'm learning here. And so my question really is, how do we answer the question? Because there is a real question about how we ensure that money goes directly to the driver. And I think that a lot of the testimony, and I'm sorry, I, I stepped out a couple times, may have already been discussed, but I wanna hear it. How we're gonna ensure that drivers get that money and that no one is gonna be left behind, no one's gonna be pushed out of that new revenue stream uh, and and so I want to hear what that what that mechanism is, uh, or if it's still just an intention, and that's okay. But then we have to solve that before we move forward. The last thing we want is for someone else to make money, and not the drivers. That's not what we want, and we're not going to move forward until we solve that. So, is there a solution to that question? Sure, uh, Councilman. Thank you for that thoughtful question. Um, it is our intent 100% uh, to make sure that the drivers are earning the money and that it's not going to the fleet owners, it's not going to Right, the, the so that's companies. the intention. So That's my intention too, that's all, all our intentions. Yeah, so, so uh, in, in the for hire vehicle industry, about 80% own, so there would be a direct connection between the, the rooftop uh, folks and the, and the car owner. Um, so that would be just a direct payment to them. Our concern is that about the 20% about the that lease um, and are caught in these leasing arrangements, we want to make sure that, that they have the ability to also earn the money. And, and that's just 20% of the drivers, not the bases. You're talking about the Correct. drivers. Yep. Okay. And, and what, we, what, what, we're, um, what we're saying is that the, the TLC, um, through, through different regulations, can actually regulate a leasing um, agreement between a driver and a leasing company and have clear uh, transparency as to what all the charges are. So for instance, if, if, if a driver goes to his leasing company and say, hey, I want the ability to earn $300, and the yeah. leasing company says, sure, go right ahead. And next, next month, his, his bill is up $300. 
um, he would be able to go to the TLC and they would be able to regulate and make sure that that's clearly seen that that the leasing company is, is increasing the cost for him. Um, making sure that um, the TLC has the regulatory authority to understand what leases are and what all the charges are is, is the first and most important step. Uh, Got it. Okay. Yeah. So really this is a, this is a, uh, it puts a lot of onus on the driver to review and if there's a discrepancy that the TLC would then have to step in and monitor, regulate that issue. Well, we is that right? Want, well, we wouldn't want the onus on the driver. Um, again, we, you know, we think that... You the, wouldn't want the onus on the driver? No, we, we, think, we think that, that uh, the TLC should be laying out what it means to be, to have a lease or a rental agreement. Um, the plates that the city gives out is a product. And the TLC should be able to regulate that product and any and any transactions that happen after that. So if if we lay out a certain standard of what leases should be, caps, for instance, right, on how much a lease can be, um, and transparency within that, we'd be protecting the drivers. We don't want a driver to unfortunately sign something that that they may not be familiar with, and then turn around and say, oh, they're stuck with it. And 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 by the way, you can't drive, but you're going to be stuck with this lease anyway. We want to make sure that everything's spelled out and clear and that all parties involved have to abide by that. Okay. Last question is on the, the public service announcement work. And I think there's a lot of hesitation to put more on the driver to add the decals for opening doors for passengers. And can anyone give me a sense about, about how willing the industry is really work, willing to work with us as we, as we design this larger framework to include more public service announcements for folks that are opening in the door to watch for bikers, and and how how willing is the industry to, to have those conversations? So I, I won't speak about the industry, but I will certainly say last spring we worked with the TLC and different biking organizations um, where we took a bike ride around Bushwick um, and understanding each other's different realms of the street. Right, we're all we're all in one room, touching one part of the elephant, and we don't know what the other part feels like. So we've been working closely with with uh, Shreya and, and Aziz and, and Tina. If you want to jump in, uh, we've been working with bike advocates and open curb space folks to to really get a sense of what our different needs are and how we can all coexist on the same street without without injuring or right uh, without hurting anyone and making sure that everyone goes from point A to point B in in, in the safest possible way. Great. Well, invite me to that conversation. I'm a I'm a biker. I don't I don't drive. I don't have a driver's license. I know how to drive, but I don't have a driver's license. Um, and I would like to be a part of that conversation. So if Great. you can invite me, that'd be wonderful. Absolutely. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. So thank you, guys. David Beyer, Peter Mazur, Richard Lipsky. Scott Rutter. May I begin? I think I'll take the other one. Yeah. Okay. Try this one. Yeah, that's better. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Rodriguez, members of the committee. My name is Peter Mazur, and I'm general counsel to the Metropolitan Taxi Care Board of Trade, a full service trade association representing the owners of approximately 5,000 medallion taxi cabs and providing services to medallion taxi cab owners and their drivers. Our primary mission is to ensure that. The Dian taxi cab industry remains strong and vibrant and continues to provide high quality, demand responsive transportation to the millions of New York City residents and visitors visiting each year. The strength of the medallion industry is premised on providing a distinctive transportation service that is in high demand. The iconic New York City taxi cab is recognized around the world as a symbol of the city. Unique features of the taxi cab business, such as the exclusive right to accept passengers by hail on the street, have been enshrined in law for more than 80 years. The taxicab industry is highly regulated and 
uh, including the color of the car, the markings, the fares that's charged, where drivers go, all are regulated. Taxi cabs are not the same as the other four higher transportation providers. They're not Ubers, they're not Lyfts, they're not black cars. Unlike most of the other transportation providers, taxi cab owners, whether they personally drive the cars or lease them to others, have made a substantial investment. They have brought their licenses either from the city directly or from other operators. In either event, their investment in most cases is worth far, far less than today than it was when they purchased their medallion. We can debate the reasons why, but the loss of revenue and diminished cash flow into the medallion taxi cab industry has certainly played a major part. Last year, passengers spent $800 million less in taxi cab fares than they spent 500 years ago. And ultimately, the only way to restore financial solvency to the taxi cab industry is to stabilize the revenue stream. And one significant part of that revenue stream is the right to, of owners to advertise both on the roofs, roofs and on the interiors of the cabs. And we have two bills that would take, that would in, expand that right to 100,000 for hire vehicles that will be operating on the streets of the city of New York. I don't think I have three minutes. Advertising clutter of this nature would detract from the value of taxicab ad placements, saturate the market, and cause advertising to be less lucrative source of income for everyone. Furthermore, permitting rooftop advertising on for hire vehicles will make them indistinguishable from taxicabs and will result in more illegal street hails. At night, when a passenger sees a rooftop, they won't see the yellow car, they don't see the black car, they don't see the medallion number, they see the rooftop and that's what they will hail and the driver will stop, especially if it's a driver that's driving for Uber and Lyft and he's off the, off the app and he has no business, he'll pull up, pick up that fare. As revenue and taxi cabs plummet for, from a saturated advertising market, Four hire vehicle owners will only marginally benefit from the addition of rooftop advertising ads as the value of these ads decrease for everyone. Taxi cabs were given the right to display interior advertising to in part to offset the cost of the required technology equipment. If interior advertising is permitted at 100,000 FHVs, then that source of revenue would be diminished to the taxi cab market as the digital advertising market becomes oversaturated. It will continue to be it will be necessary for the owners to either absorb these costs or to find some other additional funding. The city continues to consider ways to assist the taxi cab industry, and we appreciate that, to provide some sort of financial assistance to distressed owners. Does it really make sense to significantly reduce a significant source of revenue to the taxi cab industry at the same time that bailouts and other types of aid are being considered? We need to bring more, not less, revenue into this depressed industry. The four higher industry sets its own fares. Bases can re increase their revenue through a passenger fare structure. Taxi cab fares are set by regulation, and the taxi cab industry cannot increase revenue through fare adjustments not approved by the city. Advertising is one of the few sources of revenue available to the taxi cab industry that is within its control. Expanding advertising to include the for hire industry will effectively destroy that source of revenue. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak this morning. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman Rodriguez and the members of the Transportation Committee. Uh, my name is Kayla Antigua. I'm here to testify on behalf of David Beyer, who is the president of the Committee for Taxi Safety, a coalition of medallion owners and operators here in New York City. We wish to commend the City Council and Chairman Rodriguez on the speed with which it has moved to address the crisis in the taxi industry. However, we have some concerns about proposed intros 1738 and 5628 pertaining to advertisements on for hire vehicles. You have the full version of the Committee for Taxi Safety's testimony in front of you, but we would like to summarize some of the concerns, the bills before the committee today. While intended to assist in providing additional revenue streams for the for hire segment, the bill will have the unintended consequence of perpetuating the same policy making that has led to the unfettered growth in the for hire sector and has diminished the ability of drivers to earn a living. Much like the unregulated growth of the app-based services in prior years, these bills, when taken together, have the ability to reduce ad revenues in the yellow taxi industry, and as opportunities for advertisement become more widely available, companies will move towards paying less for them. Multinational companies will be well positioned to have ex exclusive deals signed with them, potentially leaving drivers with less ad revenues in their hands. 
Additionally, the unintended safety consequences to the city will result in a proliferation of eye-level advertisement that will be distracting for pedestrians and cyclists. The city has never had the nearly 100,000 plus cars displaying eye-level advertisements before. Modern technology in these advertisements will encourage distracted driving, block views, and will upend the tightly controlled number of ads in the city today. This will lead in all likelihood a, to a dangerous environment for drivers, bike riders, and pedestrians alike. The city needs to come to a place of understanding that the best way to maximize driver income, reduce congestion, and create opportunities that can arise from the existing car ad revenue base is to fully utilize the fleets that are already authorized to do so, such as the yellow and green taxis. The downside of implementing this legislation is that it will give the false sense that something has been done to alleviate this burden. In reality, as advertisement rates plummet, leaving large companies to lock in deals, independent owners will for the first time see this revenue stream dry up. Lastly, the Committee for Taxi Safety supports the introduction of the Black Car and Livery Task Force. We believe looking at these issues is important, and each time the Council has taken a holistic approach to the for hire vehicle industry, it has come up with policies that has improved driver incomes and opportunities across the board and have stabilized locally based industry, while at the same time not affecting the bottom line for multinational companies. This is the balance that needs to be struck to successfully fix this industry. We look forward to continuing our work with the committee. Thank you for your time. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Scott Rutter. I'm the Vice President of the Limousine Association of New York. I'm here today to speak on behalf of the TLC's category of luxury limousine base operators. We've testified uh, several times uh, before this committee now uh, with much appreciation for the opportunity to build a greater understanding of the significant differences that exist between the luxury limousine base designation and other FHV-based de designations that are regulated by the TLC. We think it's excellent public policy that the Council is seeking input from various stakeholders in the industry throughout, uh, through legislation to create a task force consisting of the various TLC-regulated sectors. I want to emphasize the importance of including a representative of the luxury limousine segment uh, uh, bases uh, for the formation of the new task force. Uh, we are regulated and operate in a much different manner than the black car and livery bases. We presented in, ver in previous testimony that the luxury limousine bases keep getting swept up in regulations that are aimed primarily at curbing the impacts of the TNC phenomenon, yet we don't contribute to any of the economic or congestion issues that they have largely created. Several of these issues include, first, the minimum, pay, uh, minimum driver pay requirements. Our employee-based drivers earn 50, 75, even as much as $100,000 a year in W-2-based earnings, along with sick leave, unemployment, insurance, disability, and absolutely no expenses. These are real middle-class jobs. Another issue, Midtown congestion. The FHV industry now has over 110,000 vehicles on the streets of New York, of which only about 4,000 are luxury base operators. And we've been shrinking by about a third uh, in, in recent years, which means fewer jobs for our employee drivers. Luxury bases do not provide on-demand service. We provide pre-arranged service with established customers. We do not cruise the streets looking for business, therefore creating the congestion issue. And then lastly, the vehicle moratorium. Luxury bases build our business by selling new customers, new accounts that use our services on an ongoing basis. We don't cruise looking for that business. The bottom line is that if I can't add new cars, I can't sell new business. And that means I have to lay off drivers at our company. So in closing, I ask, please include luxury base operators uh, in the new task force. We believe that we can help solve many of the issues that we all face today while saving many of the very good 
middle class jobs that we provide in the luxury segment. Thank you. Well, repeating over and over, we being in these years, you know, working with many bills on time, you know, especially bill important for the yellow. We move it, we support it, even though there was opposition from the black, from the liberal and other, because we feel that, you know, what the right thing to do. Now I'm gonna be calling all of you to go back to your thing and come back and see how we can compromise. Uh, I feel that the challenges that we have in the yellow, again, I don't have experience uh, uh, when it comes to the yellow, that as much as you have, I just had the limited one from my role as a chairman. But I think that the challenge with the yellow is to be sure that there's a financial support so that the loan that medallion owner pay instead of 3,000 that they pay today because the, the price of the medallion went from 300 to 700,000 and then, then they had to restructure the loan and now those 6,000 individual medallion owner, they had to pay a $3,000 a month. What we need to figure out is how, what can be put in place for those individual medallion owner to pay half or less than half so that they can be able to make enough to pay the mortgage to support the family so that they don't lose their house so that they can be able to maintain the student loan that they need to send the kids to college so i, I hope that also i just would like to see you also looking at the big picture i know that this is something that is a big ask I know listening and talking to you guys from the yellow perspective, you are in that position, but again, I think that I had a moral ask, respect to ask you, because I've been there moving and working in the numbers of bills that they were not supported by the sector. And we thought that was the right thing to do. I think that we need to explore, you know, can we pass a bill that I let the medallion owners who have two cars with one medallion? You know, what other things can we do not to be helpful, but again, I see adding a additional opportunity for someone to make it $300 a month. I think it's a additional good income that make a difference. In, in any individual, including us, that we live paycheck by paycheck, you know, that support a family to, uh, and to support our community. So I just want to, you know, to leave it there. I definitely need you to look at it to see how we can find some way of compromise. And, and more than, and I take your, your you know, comment very seriously. We have many meetings before, and I do, I see the limousine uh, business as a model. I hope also that we can hope to see other corporate black car structure in that way with all those benefits. And, and, and I'm committed to work with you and also uh, bringing the name of the institution as a potential member if we vote this bill that I hope it can be voted and hopefully TLC coming on board supporting. I thought that there's opportunity to create this Libre Copper, including the Limousine Task Force. Great, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thanks. Sam Jamal, Brad Saylor, George Hokett, Este Kroner. Thank you, Chairman Rodriguez. My name is Sam Jamal, and I'm Regulatory Affairs Director and Counsel for Firefly. I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify today with regard to Intro 1738, legislation that provides for higher vehicle drivers the opportunity to partner with companies like ours to earn additional revenue from rooftop advertising. Firefly is a mobility-based communications platform for, for engaging cities and surrounding communities. We, we deploy digital smart screens on top of the existing fleet of taxi and rideshare vehicles to deliver media content. Our rooftop connected screens show out-of-home advertisements designed for pedestrians in the area of the vehicle. 
They're also GPS enabled, which allows us to optimize display of creative content on the screens based on the real time location of the vehicle down to the city block level. For example, this has included advertising campaigns such as one for the grand opening of a new retail location on Fifth Avenue that was geofenced to the neighborhood around the store. Or we can run a citywide campaign with a city partner like the census that displays the same message across the city but in different languages for different neighborhoods. Firefly is a local sales and installation team based here in New York City, including an installation facility in Brooklyn. We currently operate on taxis in New York City through our partnership with the Metropolitan Taxicab Board of Trade. As you know, MTBOT is the largest trade association uh, for taxis in New York City. We have the exclusive right to deploy rooftop advertising on MTBOT's fleet of yellow taxis and are committed to growing our presence on taxis. In addition to New York City, we have hundreds of taxis and rideshare vehicles across Los Angeles, San Francisco, Dallas, Chicago, and Miami, as well as in Westchester County on rideshare. As a part of our commitment to the cities where we operate, Firefly commits 10% of our advertising inventory to pro bono messaging for nonprofit and local government partners. In New York, this has included partnerships with Amber Alert Broadcast Network and census awareness campaigns with the Association for a Better New York and the National Association of Latino Elected Officials. I'm here today because Firefly was previously operating as a TLC approved rooftop advertising fixture provider for four fire vehicles. We received our permit in June of 2019 and we're here strongly supporting the legislation. I'm happy to answer your questions on how we can make sure that this works for drivers and agree with the conversations earlier about offering a language to amend to guarantee driver pay. Thank you. Chairman Rodriguez. Chairman Rodriguez and members of the Committee on Transportation. My name is Brad Saylor. I'm the co-founder of Octopus Interactive. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the pre-considered introduction for advertising inside for hire vehicles. And thank you to all the Octopus drivers that appeared today to speak as well as show their support. We're here to urge the council to approve this introduction and eager to work with the council to address the needs of rideshare drivers in New York City. Octopus partners directly with rideshare drivers to give them Play Octopus interactive tablets. Our tablets feature games and prizes for riders as well as local information and short video advertisements. We provide the tablets, data plan, and mounting accessories to drivers for free. With Octopus, drivers report happier riders, better tips and ratings, and higher earnings. Our entire platform is supported by ad revenue. We've issued tablets to nearly 20,000 drivers in 20 of the nation's largest cities. Both riders and drivers love our product. In particular, 86% of riders and 88% of drivers report a positive experience. We operated in New York for nine months prior to the TLC reinstating its advertising ban, growing to over 2,000 active drivers. And today, you'll hear firsthand from Octopus drivers that were forced to return their tablet. Also in our written testimony, you'll see over 500 statements from satisfied New York Octopus drivers. In addition to happier riders, our drivers earn more money. They report an average 31% increase in tips, and we pay them with many earning $50 to $100 per month via direct deposits into their bank accounts. In total, our New York drivers have earned over $600,000 in Octopus payments. We currently have over 1,200 New York drivers who have completed their applications and are anxious to receive a tablet and start earning more money. The only thing stopping them is the TLC. The TLC claims that their ad ban promotes the overall rider experience. Ironically, this promotes the overall rider experience. Riders enjoy playing games, learning about their driver, and seeing local information. About 60% of our screen time is dedicated to non-advertising content, and our tablets see nearly 1 million touches per day. For uninterested riders, we offer easy controls to mute or nap the tablet, reducing brightness and sound to minimum levels. Riders can even turn the tablets completely off, as well as drivers may easily mute or power off using the buttons on the top of the tablet. The TLC's ban totally ignores these easy ways to ensure that interior advertising doesn't harm the overall rider experience. In summary, we offer a game tablet that drivers and riders love throughout the country, but we are unable to do this in New York because of the TLC's rules. We urge you to approve the pre-considered introduction before you today that would permit interior advertising and allow New York drivers to enjoy the same amenity and additional earnings as their peers in other cities. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the council, and all of my fellow brothers and sisters. I have been driving uh, 
FS, I have been FSB driver for four years now. After having the tablet, Octopus tablet inside my car, it was a good source of earnings and ratings. Every customer who came inside my car, they definitely enjoyed the game, and I was being paid for the points of the game they played. Even uh, eventually, um, they started giving me tips, cash tips, and uh, tips in the apps as well. Uh, so far, I made $375 with uh, o Octopus Tablet, and um, after the TLC ban, I was forced to return it. I definitely want it back if it's allowed back in the city. Thank you. Well, hello. Thank you, Chairman Rodriguez and other members of the council for coming today and hearing what we have to say. Uh, I started driving for about three years uh, for uh, the rideshare companies, uh, Street Hill, not Street Hill, but FHV, of course. Um, and while I was driving, I, I realized that I needed more revenue. So I searched the web, trying to find a way that I could increase the amount of earnings that I was making. When I found Octopus, I felt like it was a, a godsend. So I signed up, I didn't have to pay for the tablet, they mailed it to me, I was able to use it. And the experience that I, that I found when writers would come in and kind of not be comfortable, when I integrated the app with my vehicle, I saw immediately a difference. People came in, they were excited, they saw a device, they asked the questions, they started utilizing it. I saw children come in, little kids, playing with the app, smiling and laughing. Uh, and then when the decision got passed for me to return the tablet, not only was a financial hardship, but I saw the difference when riders would come in, when little kids would come in the car and just sit quietly with their hands folded and not be able to be entertained. And I gotta tell you, to do your job and to know that that level of satisfaction was removed from the platform, it was really detrimenting. And I don't wanna overextend my time. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have two questions. One is, how do you feel with the concern and question from the TLC commissioner about uh, how does it, in your case, I will assume it's a different business model, but in your case, or based on other also who compete in the same industry, uh, uh, what is the model that is a structure on that allow the drivers to make like the average of $300 a month? Uh, thank you for the question. And so from how Firefly operates, we operate directly with the drivers. We don't, in New York City, we haven't and have no plans to work with leasing companies um, or with the app-based companies. We go directly to the drivers and if they work 40 or more hours a week on the road, um, those are who we partner with. Uh, we, you know, there are no out-of-pocket costs to the drivers that partner with Firefly. Uh, we install the devices. There's no monthly service fee. And so for them, this really is getting paid $300 a month for doing the same job they would already be doing. We were successfully able to do this for two months with a little over 25 drivers with a longer dozens of folks on a wait list um, until the TLC unilaterally decided to end the program. Uh, and so for us, uh, you know, we think the best model to do this, is, as was kind of discussed earlier, is really make sure that the money goes straight to drivers. It's worked for us in other markets. It's worked for us in New York City. And we think this is a way to make sure that, you know, these guys that are working these long hours can earn a good supplemental income to support their families. Okay. So uh, one, one thing that uh, kind of uh, bears reiteration and is important for Octopus is that it also just it, it enhances the overall rideshare experience and our riders are seeing better tips and ratings. Um, certainly we, we pay them up to $100 a month, um, but their earnings and increased ratings, or I'm sorry, in, increased tips can be th three times that amount. 
Um, so, you know, the, the earnings are a strong motivator, but a secondary motivator. It generally improves their overall rideshare experience. Um, and an important aspect of what we do, too, is um, have a no questions asked free return policy. If the tablet's not working for them in the car, they're not earning like they expect to, they take it out, ship it back to us for free, no, no questions asked. To, to address one, one comment from the, um, the, the prior panel, um, advertising in vehicles in New York is, is not a zero-sum game. Um, we are not taking money away from interior taxi advertising. Um, we actually ha uh, have a quote in the written testimony that I'll, I'll read. It's from one of the uh, digital agencies we work with in New York City. Um, Sereno Coin signed a contract with Octopus to run ads for the rest of the year. Barton said they did not take from their budget dedicated to taxi TV, but rather are pulling from their digital budget. There are many, many Fortune 500 companies that want their advertisements in and on vehicles in New York City. So let's bring that value into the city, into drivers' pockets, and not try to take it from rideshare pockets and put it into, into yellow taxi pockets. Okay. And, and can, can the tablets work in the, I mean, I will assume the technology is there. <clears throat> can it also work with different, multiple language for different community, give that option to people? Yeah, so we, uh, we, we actually recently ran a Univision campaign and, and they decided to do that in, in Spanish. We did English subtitles. Um, we can do, do vice versa. Um, but yes, that's, that's technology that we can, we can definitely do. Um, and then to go to the, to the PSA um, comment earlier from uh, Councilman Menchaca, um, if, if the TLC has, a, has an ad they would like us to run about not opening the door in, into bike lanes, we could get that on the, on the tablets within a day. Okay. I, I think that it is very important to know that, you know, the commitment and the technology is there for provide, you know, the application in multiple languages so that people, you know, they have the option to, you know, click into English, Spanish, French, or any other language, the Mandarin, Cantonese, so that is an option to the writers to know in which language they want to navigate what is there in the tablets. The other thing is about to one of the other things about how much do you reinforce are the option that people, that what you provide, especially in the tablet related to children, is more educational uh, than, you know, a creating an opportunity for, you know, and as a father to daughter, 16, 13, for me this is about, I want to expose if there's anything. Technology can be negative or positive, so in that part, it's about there's a lot of apps and programming, uh, software on education, environmental, animals, math, science, that is not yet about what you have seen promoting violence. So how much do you look and take the measure to be sure that what is provided in, in all those uh, uh, software installed are more focusing on education? De definitely. So, um, you know, our, our drivers can attest, um, whether they're 80 years old or, or 8 years old, that, that riders appreciate the tablet. Um, we have this, this picture trivia game. We've actually recently rolled this out uh, just to make it easier for, for children to play. Uh, who's this, who's this uh, um, singer? Bob Marley. Then they don't have to read a bunch of text like our traditional trivia game. Um, so we're, we're always optimizing like that. We have a direct communication line with tens of thousands of drivers that are giving us feedback on the tablets every single day. So the, the, the tablet and the product have evolved from that feedback and, and will continue to evolve to address um, the, those exact things that you mentioned. Okay. I just, I mean, let's be sure that whatever, you know, I want to leave beh behind those years in the 80s when Walter used to work in the Burnside City College and I used to be organizing, taking over the building. So, so those years was here that, you know, what daycare used to be, used to be places where people have a TV, especially in the poor neighborhood, and sending the kids to be spending the whole day in front of the TV. So whatever is offered on advertising, I want for us to look at it more interactive, more related to educational opportunity, complement whatever educational happening in the, in the, in the school. Thank you. Piano two.
Uh, and just on our end with Firefly, we only display community appropriate advertising. We don't run tobacco ads, e-cigarettes, firearms, or adult entertainment advertisements. We know how important it is to make sure that it's community appropriate and we're willing to work with the TLC and the council to continue to do that as well as, like I mentioned before, the 10% of ads on PSAs. Right now, we're hyper committed to helping with some of our nonprofit partners educate for outreach on the census, which we know is very important to the city. And we're looking at other partnerships as well, just to be able to use the reach of these vehicles and the screens to get out different messages and help with public education. So we have Raul Rivera, uh, uh, who was no IDG. If there's any other driver who were no RDG, please come to the table. And, and with that, we will finish this section for the public. Any drivers who are no IDG, you want your seat, yet please be sure beside Raul Rivera, that also you say your name so that we'll be sure that is in the record. You can begin. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, uh, honorable uh, chairman, members of the committee, and uh, my fellow workers. I'm driving in New York City almost 20 years in yellow industry, in livery industry, and now in app-based company. And uh, I'm having my own vehicle and operating uh, indoor advertisement uh, Octobus tablet. And that was very good and very impressive by the customers, especially they encouraged uh, to play while I was driving. And besides that, I'm getting uh, almost $100 per month from the Octopus uh, regarding the bonus points. And I'm encouraging uh, to have this internal advertisement uh, and passengers' entertainment like Octopus inside the car. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, hello, Chairman. Uh, we thank you uh, for having this, and uh, I'm speaking on, on, on my own behalf, but I am sure that there's some traction out there on, on the things that I'm going to raise. Uh, re relative to the, the advertising and, and, and uh, yeah, anything that, that, that a driver can have in their vehicle, uh, I, I think the most important thing relative to that is that that driver, indeed and in fact, is an independent contractor. He's not an employee of a larger group. He is an independent contractor. You know, we happen to be also in New York, unlike any other city in this, in, 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 in this, in, in this country, in this great country, uh, TLC drivers, which means we are clearly called to a professional standard. Uh, I'm retired military. I, I, I've been an x-ray tech. You know, I held that license for many years. Uh, I have chosen to do what I do right now. And I'm doing it as an independent contractor uh, uh, who happens to hold a TLC license to, pr to prove and to show the level of professionalism that I, 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 I uh, elect to operate on and by. So having said that, uh, you know, sometimes I hear things and I wonder if it's understood. I, I hear your speech, uh, Chairman Didanis Rodriguez, and I, I really like that you, you, you've lived it yourself. You understand that for many people, this is a stepping stone to greater things for them and their families. And, and I really appreciate that. But uh, I hear, a hint of marginalization sometimes, and that, that's disturbing to me because it manifests in larger things. Things gather their own momentum, and, and, and then the driver's voice is lost. One thing that uh, I, I am a five-star driver. I've done over 8,000 rides in about two years and nine months. Um, I, I get a lot of tips. I don't have this advertising. I don't have any problem with these advertising. I love the concept. 
My only challenge with it is, are we limited to $100 a month or $300 a month? Because indeed and in fact, you are in my car. You know what I mean? And you're getting the benefit of advertising in the customers that I am serving. So I'm hoping that this is not some limited uh, uh, amount of income uh, that can cannot be renegotiated uh, down the line as as uh, drivers successfully navigate the streets of New York and environs uh, for the advertising to be shown. Okay, so, so that's, that's, that's uh, one point. Another point, and this is my, my larger point, I've done over 8,000 rides. Uh, I, I, as an FHV driver, it's on a prearranged basis. Uh, as I said, I'm a five-star driver, so there are people who ride with me who would like to ride with me again. Currently, there is no mechanism for, for what I provide, the level of service that I provide, to be reselected by passengers who would like to ride with me again. And I find that problematic because I am conducting a business effort. And I think that that should be uh, addressed. I don't want to do street hails. There was a gentleman here who made sure I have zero interest in doing street hails. I want to know who's getting in my car. So that earlier point about, uh, you know, if somebody sees the advertising on a car, I, I have to respectfully dismiss that. But um, I really believe that there needs to be a, a mechanism for passengers who want to become my customers to, to whatever degree, on whatever recurring basis, uh, to have that wherewithal. Uh, because I think that many drivers are very professional and, and do create their own customer bases, but they are separated from those customer bases, and that money has to go to larger app organizations, and, 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 and I, that, that troubles me. In other words, people are being kept uh, with reduced incomes for no reason when they've worked to have uh, a basis for earning. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. I just want to mention that my fellow driver here, he yielded his time to me to, to read four minutes. Um, muchas gracias. Uh, I didn't write anything down. I'm just going to speak off the top of my head. But uh, uh, Bill uh, 1738, I'm for it. I'm for it. Even though I don't want one of those advertising uh, signs on my car, I'm for it. As long as it doesn't hurt the driver, as long as the companies don't abuse the driver, and we're going to monitor that on our own. Uh, and also, that they don't rip off the driver. Um, again, personally, I don't want it on my vehicle. Uh, the reasons why is because uh, we have an additional 60% TLC inspectors on the force, and we need more protection. And putting a sign like that on my vehicle would make me a target, an easy target to just give more tickets and more tickets and more tickets. I was in Williamsburg this past uh, weekend. TLC was all over the place. And, then, and now, because there's 60% more, they're traveling in packs. You, you used to see one or two, but now you see two or three cars. You see this up in, in, in upper Manhattan, you see it in the Bronx, and you see it in Brooklyn. I work Brooklyn a lot, and that's where I've seen them. Uh, the, we, we listened to what the chairman said from, from the TLC. Um, Unfortunately, he didn't get the job. Uh, maybe if he would have gave us a driver sit down like you did, you sat down with us and, and we spoke, we, we put our concerns, you signed the petition to reform the TLC. You agree with me that the TLC needs to be reformed. I mentioned a, a CCRB for the TLC because now that we have 60% more inspectors, we're gonna need protection. We need to be able to report uh, uh, an inspector that crosses the line. Um, if, if uh, I'm, I'm gonna point out a few more things. If you don't have an email, if you don't have an active email with the TLC, they fine you 300 bucks. Uh, we had the double jeopardy, where if you went through a red light camera, uh, if you have a TLC plate, it's $400 and three points, right? If it's a regular plate, it's 50 bucks. We have to create bills. Every time we need something, we have to create bills to get more stuff for the drivers. It seems like the TLC has more power than the city council. 
It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing. Now, I, I want to finish off on this real quick. We, I also want to mention that we are not employees. We need to be protected. We are independent contractors. We don't need AB5. We are independent contractors, and we need to protect that. Also, I want to mention that it's unfortunate that we have a, a city council member by the name of Antonio Reynoso. Antonio Reynoso is a city council member. He's also part of transportation committee. He failed to give myself and my fellow drivers a meeting, and I think it makes the committee look bad. When you have a, a, a person of color, his uncle is a driver, and he refuses to meet with us. So you, we sent you an email, and we're asking that Mr. Reynoso be removed from the transportation committee. If you fail to listen to the drivers, you cannot help them. It's very simple. You listen to us. We appreciate that. We thank you. We are very appreciative of you. You gave us a sit down, you listen. We sat down with nine city council members. We sat down with Ruben Diaz Jr., borough president of the Bronx. We got more meetings with more borough presidents of the city, and it's very simple. You don't, you don't have to sign the petition. You could say yes or you could say no, but you don't have the option to ignore us. And we ask that Reynoso be removed. We ask, we're, okay. not, gonna, we're not gonna stop. We're gonna ask. We already sent the email to you and, and Corey Johnson. We want them off the committee because it's very insulting. Okay, very thank you. Insulting. Thank you, thank you, Raúl. And, and uh, first of all, as I said before, conversation. You, sorry, thank you. So the conversation will continue on this topic today on this bill, and uh, we also would like to use this opportunity also to invite all New Yorkers to come tomorrow at noon at the Staples City Hall and join the movement that it is working on introducing a bill to allow New Yorkers with green card and working permit to vote in municipal election as it was allowed in the late 1900s and the beginning of the 2000, 1920, still in Texas it was allowed. And I think that having an industry of so many immigrants too, as myself being an immigrant with green card, who was part of the delivery taxi from 83 to 2000, I know that it will help to show what democracy is all about when we will provide opportunity again for New Yorkers to be able to elect the mayor, the controller, the public advocate, the board president, and the council member. So everyone is invited to be here tomorrow at noon. We also like to invite everyone to come here to our next hearing, which is gonna be on the 29th. And at that particular one, we will be holding a hearing, improving oversight with few bills probably uh, addressing improving a street and vehicle safety. Uh, as everyone know, there's a different law in Europe where all the truck, when they are put in the street, they already have the technology with the sensor inside. Here in the United States, there's a bipartisan bill by Senator Gillibrand and Marco Rubio. I believe that they also calling for the, uh, the, the, the manufacturers of trucks uh, that they put truck in the street to also be installed with sensors. Meeting with the trucking association, they also are committed to continue doing this part when it comes to making the streets safety for pedestrians. Uh, we also have many intersections in the city of New York that we had the time separate for pedestrians and for drivers to make a turn. So we will be listening from DOT and the private sector on how much technology are there, how are they doing on technology, how can we also redesign our intersections since more than 80% of the crashes that happen in the city of New York happening intersection. So that's gonna be our next hearing on the 29th year at the council. I would like to thank the committee staff, Elio Lim, Alex Washington, both of them council, Rick Abello, senior policy analyst, Chima Obricher, financial unit head, and John Basile, finance analyst. With that, this hearing is adjourned. Boycott Reynoso, boycott Reynoso.